mute. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final day of FHFA's 2024 Tech Sprint Demo Day. Yes, round of applause. Yes, yes. I'm Lawrence Mack. I'm from FHFA's Office of Financial Technology. And I'm Leah Price, also from FHFA's FinTech office. Lawrence and I will be your MCs this morning. We're thrilled to have you all here today, both in person and online, joining us via live stream. Before we begin, we'd like to remind everyone that today's session is being recorded. Please make sure to shut off your devices or that they're set to silence so that everyone can enjoy today's event. And we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us today. Your enthusiasm and support for this tech sprint means a lot to us. And this is bigger than just a one-time event. We're all living through what might just be the most transformational moment in the history of technology. Generative AI has captured the intention of the entire world, and there are significant efforts underway in the pri private and public sectors to harness the benefits of this technology. And the best part is that we're all able to participate as it unf unfolds in front of our very eyes. Now, Leah, I'm a former banker, also a Libra, Libra Scorpio cusp, and I'm newer to te technology. <laughs> Maybe like me, the audience would benefit if we take a moment to define generative AI. That's a good idea, Lawrence. I'm actually a tech trends nerd, so I'll call on uh, NVIDIA that defines generative AI as a model that takes inputs such as text, image, audio, video, and code, and generates new content. That's so helpful, Leah. So we're, what we're seeing today at Demo Day is all related to generative AI technology specifically. That's right, Lawrence, and this event is the culmination of our tech sprint. We have 12 teams who've been brainstorming and working all week, lined up and ready to present their proposed use cases for generative AI in housing finance. Leah, I am so excited. Not only do we have this timely theme of generative AI, but we're building on everything we learned from our inaugural tech sprint last year. I've been looking forward to this moment all year. Speaking of which, time to get on with the show. Before we introduce our opening speaker, we've prepared a little video that helps illustrate while we're all here today. A home is more than just a house. It's the center of your life and the foundation for your future. A home is often the largest asset a family owns and serves as a primary way to build wealth that can be passed on to children and grandchildren. And regardless of whether you rent or own, a home provides you with stability and a sense of belonging and community that goes far beyond its monetary value. Yet many people encounter challenges securing a stable home. Renters grapple with housing affordability as rapidly increasing rent costs outpace wage growth, leaving half of all renters finding it difficult to afford their rent. And people trying to buy a home often struggle with a complicated financing process, one where the average cost to originate a mortgage has increased by a third in the past three years and home prices have surged over 50% in the past five. And the racial home ownership gap is wider today than it was 50 years ago. With these challenges, many Americans are at risk of losing access to home ownership. And people who prefer the community and flexibility of renting or may not be ready to buy a home are finding it harder to find a place to live, no matter what their incomes are. But what if we could harness technology to solve the biggest challenges in housing, like we do in other industries? To create a more equitable and sustainable housing finance system, where renters are able to find more affordable housing, where the path to homeownership is more accessible for everyone, and where both renters and homeowners are provided with the information and resources they need to stay in their homes through financial hardship. FHFA believes this future is possible. 
That's why we've brought together experts from across the industry for a tech sprint to explore ways to improve housing with generative AI. While generative AI holds immense promise, it also comes with risks we cannot ignore. And realizing its potential depends on using the technology responsibly, maximizing benefits, minimizing risks, and ensuring safety and soundness. FHFA believes that together, we can foster this kind of responsible innovation to promote a transparent, fair, equitable, and inclusive housing finance system. One that meets the changing needs of lenders, investors, homeowners, and renters. FHFA calls upon all participants to rise to these historic challenges through collaboration and innovation. Because we're stronger together, and what we create today will shape the communities of tomorrow. So as you can all see today, it is about advancing responsible innovation to improve, improve outcomes for home buyers, renters, and market participants in housing finance. To elaborate on the video's theme, it is our honor to introduce our first speaker, Anne-Marie Pippin, FHFA's Deputy Director of the Division of Conservatorship Oversight and Readiness. Anne-Marie has over 13 years of public sector experience in mortgage finance, innovation, risk management, and corporate governance. In her seven years at FHFA, Anne-Marie has held key roles in shaping FHFA's supervisory guidance to its regulated entities and was instrumental in the founding of the Office of Financial Technology in 2022. Anne-Marie also co-authored FHFA's 2022 Advisory bu Bulletin on Artificial Intelligence and Machine Risk Learning, Machine Learning Risk Management, which made FHFA the first U.S. federal reg financial regulator to issue public supervision guidance on expectations for establishing an AIML governance and risk management framework, and the first regulator to hold a tech sprint, this tech sprint focused on generative AI. Please join me in welcoming Anne-Marie to the stage. Well, thank you, Leah and Lawrence, for getting us started. And good morning, everyone. It is great to be here in person with you all. Uh, I actually had the lovely fortune of experiencing some of the interconnected risks of technology and what that feels like earlier this week firsthand when my flights uh, were delayed coming back from a conference, uh, which meant that I uh, live streamed uh, the opening of the sprint on Monday. This definitely underscores why we have asked our teams to produce not only the best use cases, but also the best control measures in order to be recognized today. And today is Demo Day, which is the finale of FHFA's 2024 tech sprint focused on generative AI in housing finance. <clears throat> After three days of sprinting, collaborating, brainstorming, ideating, and developing, today's the day we get to see what our teams have come up with. But first, I would like to give a big thank you for everyone being here today. A big thanks to all of the wonderful FHFA and Constitution Center staff and security who helped set everything up and then kept everything running smoothly this week. As Tracy mentioned on opening day, so many people make this event happen, and we want to thank and acknowledge them for all the time and work that they put into making the tech sprint such a great event. We'd also like to thank all of our participants that represent stakeholders across the mortgage and tech industry, as well as all of our subject matter experts from FHFA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae, CFPB, and NVIDIA for taking time out of busy schedules to spend the past four days sprinting with us. And a big thank you to all of our distinguished panel of judges our, our judges have the hard work of analyzing the presentations we're about to hear and recognizing which ones have the most potential to impact several of the housing challenges Director Thompson, Lisa Rice, Lori Goodman spoke about on opening day, including how to make the housing finance system more transparent, fair, equitable, and inclusive for both mortgage borrowers and renters. 
like our participants, our panel of judges that are drawn from across the housing finance ecosystem, uh, from nonprofits, startups, and think tanks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Akinwumi, Chief Responsible AI Officer from the National Fair Housing Alliance. Michael, if you'd stand, just wave. Thank you. We have Jan Davis, Vice President of Operations at MISMO. We have Melissa Coide, CEO of FinReg Lab. We have Michael Neal, Senior Fellow, Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. And then finally, Jeff Walker, CEO and co-founder of Credivolve. Now, before we get to the main event, the demonstrations that we're all here for, uh, in which the teams get to pitch their ideas, I'd like to highlight our goals for the tech sprint. Tech sprints are one of the tools FHFA uses to better understand how financial technology can be used to address some of the most pressing challenges our industry faces, such as closing the home ownership gap and addressing the lack of credit access and availability in underserved communities, and helping renters be able to find housing that's affordable. As the director highlighted earlier this week, we held our first agency tech sprint last year on the challenge of understanding how data flows through the pipes throughout the mortgage ecosystem, as well as the barriers to wider adoption of more digital and automated processes that could reduce costs and save time. The themes from last year's sprint helped frame and advance the conversation about what could be addressed through responsible adoption of powerful new technologies like artificial intelligence which of course laid the groundwork for this year's theme and focus on generative AI in housing finance. Now this year we've organized our tech sprint by centering around the challenge of how might responsible use of generative AI promote a transparent, fair, equitable, and inclusive housing finance system while fostering sustainable home ownership and rental opportunities. Generative AI has the power to impact our daily lives which we're already seeing through tools like ChatGPT. We think the underlying capabilities of the technology are also well suited to address many of the challenges in housing and housing finance. Generative AI's capabilities for content generation, personalized and advanced search functionalities, data interrogation and summarization, just to name a few, have the ability to really improve mortgage and rental processes and the consumer experience and ease of navigating these processes. But these capabilities do not come without the associated risks. So one of our main goals for the sprint this year is to advance the conversation on what responsible adoption of generative AI looks like in housing finance, pushing forward our collective industry and regulatory understanding of the technology and how to manage the risks that may come along with its broader use in the industry. Today, we welcome those with us here in Constitution Center, which includes executive leadership from the enterprises and CSS, leaders throughout the industry, along with leaders from FHFA and other regulators, as well as everyone online to collectively hear these creative use cases in the housing finance sector and to hear insights as to how to best mitigate the associated risks. Now this is gonna be informative as we all continue to think about the appropriate guardrails to adopt this technology responsibly, underpinning many of the objectives outlined in the White House executive order on AI. Okay, and now it's time to hear these creative solutions. Remember uh, that the judges will recognize the best ideas from teams in each of the following four categories of focus. First, Consumer experience. So this focuses in on how might generative AI be used to further educate and empower prospective home buyers in evaluating, comparing, and obtaining a mortgage loan and in sustaining their home ownership over time. And is there also an opportunity for generative AI to empower prospective renters and tenants in obtaining and sustaining rental housing? The second area, assessing creditworthiness. So here, how might generative AI be used to improve the evaluation of home buyer credit, as well as the fairness of the credit decisions related to mortgage loans, particularly for home buyers from underserved communities? Third area, operations. 
So how might generative AI be used to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of operational processes within the housing finance system, from origination to servicing and secondary market activities? And last but not least, risk and compliance. How might generative AI be used to enhance the effectiveness of housing finance risk management and compliance processes? All right, and with that, now is the time to start the demos. Lawrence, Leah, back over to you guys. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for highlighting FHFA's focus on responsible innovation in housing finance and why FHFA's tax fronts are such an important tool. Now let's get started on our team presentations. All week, our 12 teams have been solving for the problem statements that Anne-Marie mentioned just a minute ago. And she mentioned how teams have selected one of the four areas to focus their use case presentations, consumer experience, assessing creditworthiness, operations, risk, and compliance. Each team will have seven minutes to present, followed by a three-minute Q&A session with our judges. And don't worry, we'll have a timekeeper who will be keeping us, helping us stay on time, and Lawrence and I are going to be sticklers. Absolutely. And after the presentations, the judges will deliberate and select the most promising use cases and control measures in these four areas. We will have two breaks. The first break will be after the first six presentations, and the second break will be during the judges' deliberation. This will be an opportunity to stretch your legs, grab some refreshments, and mingle with your fellow attendees. And to our virtual audience, this is your chance to grab a coffee. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first team is Mortgage Minds. Oops, Oops. sorry, Team Dream Decoders, thank you. this way ah there we are is this my advance button okay we are Jennifer and Mark representing team four and we're the dream decoders we're translating the complex mortgage complexity into home ownership reality we decided to focus on the problem statement of consumer experience and specifically how gen AI solutions can help underserved populations Let's talk a little bit about the problem. Buying, the home, buying a home is very complicated and can be overwhelming, especially if you are a, have limited English proficiency. We found some compelling data to reinforce our focus in this area. First of all, the Census Bureau identified that 68 million households speak a language other than English at home. 29 million of those are considered limited English proficiency, or LEP. The Urban Institute published a paper in May of this year that was terrific. It identified that the number of LEP home households have nearly tripled in the last four decades. Also in the same paper, they identified that the average reading level of mortgage disclosures is the 11th grade. If you look at the US literacy statistics, the average reading level is seventh grade. So there's lots of room for opportunity and improvement here. Let's talk about the addressable market. Urban Institute stated that removing loan barriers for LEP consumers would increase the number of homeowners by 300,000. The graph on this slide also demonstrates the gap between English proficient borrowers and LEP borrowers, with English proficient consumers having a home ownership rate of 67%, and LEP consumers having a homeownership rate of just 39%. What's our solution? Our solution is Loan Buddy. This is an application and web plugin. It will help LEP consumers and really all consumers navigate the complex mortgage process. Let's talk about Mike and Mary as an example. They moved recently from Puerto Rico and they want to buy a home. They speak English, but don't have a really high reading comprehension level, and have expressed their preference to speak and communicate in Spanish. 
Here's an example looking at their loan estimate on mobile. We chose a mobile example because most LEP consumers are mobile first, but a loan buddy will work in mobile and web. We also chose the example of the loan estimate as one document, but Loan Buddy will work on all standard mortgage documents, including the 50 plus closing documents that we use. So here, they're looking at the loan estimate, they see the raised hand of Loan Buddy, click on that, and the first question that they're asked is, what is their language preference? And then they will see the four options, to translate, summarize, define, or ask questions. Let's show you an example of translation. If I select the translation, then you see everything in Spanish, including all the loan buddy options. And so they proceed in the language of their choice. We'll now show an example of summarization. And I'm going to turn the time to Mark, who will show a working prototype of the Gen AI solution we've built. Thank you, Jennifer. We're proud to share that we've built over this week a working prototype of the summary feature. Now, it's a back-end solution, so we quickly uh, drew up a front-end visual to give you a sense of what the output looks like. So here, you're going to see Loan Buddy summarizing Michael and Mary's loan estimate. We show a summary to you first here in English, and then we're going to go ahead and select Spanish as the uh, language preference, and now you see the loan estimate summarized here in Spanish. We worked hard on that all week. <laughs> so we know that the power of Gen AI can help us bridge the gap for these LEP consumers. Uh, but as an industry, we must be responsible with how we apply this innovative technology. So we built a series of control measures to ensure that um, our, we are compliant and that the four features of our app um, are optimized. We start with translation. Uh, we use a concept called back translation to ensure accuracy. Simply put, is we take an English copy, translate it to another language, and then translate it using the same model back to English to look for discrepancies. And we also set thresholds for the content and make sure it's only produced if the model's confidence score is higher than that threshold. We also limit the model's knowledge base to the content in question, and this helps mitigate any hallucination. Quality control at Loan Buddy involves a human in the loop. It's a periodic review to ensure that our outputs are accurate and compliant. And we've also trained the model to definitions from industry authorities like the FHFA, CFPB, the GSEs, MISMO, and other regulators, and this optimizes our RAG. And last, and probably the most important control measure, is we refer back to the loan team on their expertise when we're unable to answer a question. And this is why our solution is a cobot and not a replacement for industry professionals. So here, let's quickly go through, touch some of our technology points. In the infrastructure, we use a multi-language foundation model with GPUs that host the model to make our solution speedy and accurate. And as Jennifer mentioned, we integrate with all kinds of mobile devices, apps, and browsers via a plugin. Privacy is so important in housing finance. So we, limit the, the, we allow the users to limit the data that gets been sent, sent back to the loan team. And for data on our possession, it automatically gets wiped within seven days. And we do a human in the loop on periodic uh, uh, evaluation of our resources, again, to ensure the accuracy and compliance. So in conclusion, the potential for Gen AI to address this barrier in LEP consumers is enthralling. Imagine Michael and Mary being two of the 300,000 consumers that we're able to help by democratizing generative AI in a specific market segment that needs it the most. Thank you so much for your time. We are Dream Decoders. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, thank you very much. Judges, now off to you for our questions. Uh, this is Michael Neal. Um, I mean, terrific presentation. I think you're hitting at uh, a critical issue, particularly the way that 
we see the data in terms of population projections. Um, quick question here, curious about uh, any sense of the share of this particular population that has access to a smartphone, access to internet, um, and the like? Yeah, so there, there are other studies um, that show that um, underserved communities, minority communities in the United States um, tend to be mobile first, and limited English proficiency consumers make up a great segment of that population. So we did reference some studies that show that because underserved consumers um, tend to be LEP, our solution kind of overlaps and applies to both. Thank you. So guys, great use case and one that certainly is gonna resonate with folks in the audience here. Um, you talked about the sources of your data um, and you mentioned it could be um, FHFA, it could be HUD, it could be the GSEs. What do you intend to do in the event that the uh, documentation uh, does not align between the sources? How do you prioritize your evaluation? Yeah, so we specifically thought about this question. Um, there are multiple sources and often multiple definitions. Um, what we had thought as a team is that we would base that on the document, the source of the document. If it's a CS CFPB form, then CFPB definition might be the hierarchical top there. And so it would depend on the document that's being used, but definitely we would need to define what the hierarchical order is for using the definitions. And as we mentioned, if the uh, model does not have a high confidence answer, then we refer the consumer back to the loan experts. Do the... Um would the consumer have the ability to provide feedback into the loop as based on their experience? Yes, um, so one of the four features, uh, we just ran out of time to build this week, one of the four features is the ask, uh, where it is a natural language conversation that any consumer can have with the model, um, but also it is recorded and the user session is sent back to their loan professionals so that they can have maybe more an in-depth or a different type of conversation that perhaps the model can't answer. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to use text, speech, and images as a way to interact with Lone Betty. All right, I think that does it for our questions. Can we give a big round of applause for our team? All right, outstanding. So our next team will be hearing from Guardians of the FinTech. Team, take the stage. Guardians of the FinTech, are you ready? <laughs> ready. <laughs> All right, terrific. Lawrence, is this my fast forward button? Okay, great. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Tara Roach, and my colleague Melissa Cromwell and I are bringing to you a proposal for unlocking affordability opportunities in the multifamily market. So shocking no one here, uh, we're dealing with a pretty rough supply crisis. Uh, today we're facing about a four to seven million unit shortage, and this particularly affects renters. Um, over the last four years, national average rents have increased by about 30%. Um, you know, at least half of renters are cost burdened, meaning they're paying 30% of their income or more on rent and utilities, and millions more are severely cost burdened, paying 50% or more of their income. Um, but there are bipartisan policy solutions here. Federal, state, and local policymakers and regulators are looking and finding solutions. So let's talk about how to address that challenge. Um, clearly there's lots we could be doing better in the housing market together, but one area where we see some opportunity is driving new capital to the multifamily space with a focus on affordability. So we're, we're proposing a tool, <clears throat> excuse me, to decrease complexity and barriers to entry for especially new um, entrants in the market who don't have existing uh, experience bringing low cost or multifamily, affordable multifamily units to market. So today, only the most sophisticated investors uh, partake in this space because it's pretty, a, a pretty complex process. Uh, you have to know a lot to bring these deals to fruition to make them pencil. 
Um, and we think that you know, a lot of the time they're employing outside experts. Um, it's a pretty uh, laborious process to, to source different kinds of data. Um, so there's a lot of uh, kind of missed opportunities for efficiency in this process of, again, bringing new capital into the market. And so this tool would combine real-time data um, with, um, uh, in the market focused on affordability. Um, and this would also blend with the opportunity for the investor to create a business plan outline and also pull together some capitalization options, so their sources and funding. Um, and this would be for all units, so looking at projects that are new construction, rehabilitation, conversion of commercial to residential, uh, for acquisition, um, refinancing, and looking to preserve affordable units. Um, sorry, and this could also include the, the current and projected uh, needs and affordability. We think this could also bring in um, state and local policy changes uh, and kind of help predict what the opportunities are for a particular area for certain properties as well. All right, so Tara already talked a little bit about who this is intended to serve. So let's maybe just jump into the meat of it a little bit. The application is a web-based application that is backed by generative AI. When you pop in at first sight, you're going to see some information about the demographics in your area, along with some areas of opportunity that are in your local area. You can also choose to change your area if you're an investor that is looking for somewhere outside of your current market and you want to explore new opportunity. This also scales for individuals that are less experienced or more experienced. At the top, you can jump right into the investor section and just jump right to the places that you might want some help with or some areas to explore, particularly if you're just looking for affordable opportunity or want you know, just some suggestions on where to go or ask some questions of the chat. The middle, however, will give you a chat. So if you are newer to the space, you might want to use this to plug in some information just as a place to start. So let's say that you want to do a conversion on 123 Main Street. Or maybe you don't really know what you want to do. So you go in and just start to plug in an address as an area of interest. It can prompt you with some questions to say, what are you here to do? Are you here to acquire? Are you here to renovate? Do you want to build a business plan? What are we doing here? Right. So the chat can then be interactive. It will walk you through, step by step, different pieces of the process. It will show you assistance programs in your area. It will show you options for debt and financing, equity. It can give you some comparative analysis around options for building your capital. It can even help you put together that pro forma. But let's say you are more experienced and you really are just using this for affordable opportunity identification. You can go through and pick and choose what you want as an investor. You can upload documents if you already have a lot of this information collected from other resources or have systems put in place that you already want to utilize. Upload, scrape, and add it to the business plan. Add it to the model. So in the background, it's doing all of these things. The moment that you engage with the application, it's starting to pull together information. And ultimately, the output can be either a report that you can continuously go back to, you can update the information, and it can feed you back through your next steps of the process. Or you can do something uh, a little less inclusive. Maybe you just want to go through and look at your capitalization options. So it's customizable based on what you have input. So let's look at the tech really quick. Again, it is backed by generative AI. Uh, the process is pretty simple, and I can say that because number one, I didn't build it, and also because we had a very excellent tech expert on our side that went through and put this together. But the moment that you begin engaging with the application, it's putting together this information for you. It is aggregating information about areas of opportunity. It's giving you the risks. It's showing your demographics. It's building a business case for you, and it's putting together your next steps so that you know where to go. So let's look at the data flow. So we have a couple different options. You've got your investor or municipalities that might be accessing this information. They're going to input, they may upload, and then it's going to go through a retrieval process, going out to all of the various places that are currently bifurcated and segregated across a lot of complex places, pull it together through its retrieval, run it through different analytics, and give you the output that we're looking for. Of course, we know with new technology, there's always risks. Particularly with AI, we know that there's hallucinations, right? We can have bad prompts by users. We have concerns about uh, sensitivity of information. In order to capture these, we have to continuously and rigorously backtest our models. We also have to tune them so that we're putting the appropriate guardrails in place so that the model is not producing output that is not accurate. 
Um, and in a future phases, we do think there's an opportunity to scale this. For example, you know, depending on the stakeholders, so renters who are looking for opportunities to find specific affordable units they qualify for. Um, enterprise data insights, so governments and municipalities who are looking for um, trends, housing gaps, and other information. Um, and other incentives that could help drive efficiency here, so new tax incentives or streamlined processes. All right, thank you so much. Now it's time for judges' questions. <laughs> Three minutes. Done. So fascinating, thank you. Melissa Coity, what are the practicalities at this point in time in terms of accessing the data in a form that is really accessible? And is the idea to start in certain jurisdictions and grow? Absolutely, yeah, so the model that we mocked up, like that's real data, we pull that in from all the different sources, kind of based on everyone's expertise. So a lot of it is government administrative data, uh, census data. So this exists out there, it's just kind of fractured and it's a lot of work pulling that together and so there's nothing that does that today and also works in like a predictive model to help you on your specific project. Uh, we do think good use cases would be in places of high opportunity. Um, you know, this supply problem isn't just in the most expensive cities. We know all kinds of places are dealing with this. Everyone's looking for more affordable options, uh, especially around transit centers, places that really you know, could do with more uh, multifamily density. We think those would be good opportunities. Yeah. So Jan Davis, could you please talk a little bit more about con the controls and particularly around the data? You're bringing data in from a whole bunch of different disparate sources and kind of pulling it together. How are you making sure that that's working well, that that's not inadvertently creating adverse conditions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, a lot of this is already vetted data. We would be very careful about the sources that are used to pull in data here. It's also an opportunity to vet that as well. I think something that AI could do is also find inconsistencies across data that we just might not see in the way we sort of you know, bring data together to, to bring projects to fruition today. Um, so there's some opportunities there to actually find consistencies, not just bring them. Um, but again, you know, this isn't telling you here's exactly how your project is gonna go and how your funding is gonna go and move on. It's meant to be iterative. You know, it's something that you take to your lender, you take to a project partner. Like, there are a lot of places where you continue to vet this data, um, and it's not making up data. It's using data to help predict what a, a plan could look like. Correct, and just like any other technology solution, it's not plug and play and forget, right? You have to continuously go back, test, back test, and ensure that it's behaving as you expect it to. So great use case, um, a lot of comments on data. How do you measure success? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, this depends on the market. Um, look, if we could see an increase in 3% of units annually, that would be great. And if we saw 50% um, of those being driven towards affordability, especially in transit or high opportunity areas, we would consider that successful. If we see a lot of new capital coming into the market or the ability for earlier investors to be participating in this space, that's how we would look at outpack, uh, outputs and measure impact. Um, it's pretty limited today. Definitely. Right. Getting the opportunity to diversify the capital that's coming into the market as well, opening it up to newer players that might not otherwise know how to do it. All right, thank you. That's all the time we have. Thank you. All right, now we have Team Open Angels. Happy Thursday. We're Open Angels. We're here to make people's lives easy on making a match from a renter's point of view and a property manager's point of view. Property owner's point of view. We believe this process is fragmented. We know that our platform, Domino AI, is going to make this an Uber-like experience. Make it simple and make it transparent and make it certain. We will be able to impact 30 million renters that rent today throughout this process. So, because of the big market, because of all this confusion, we know Domino can handle all this. I'm gonna hand it over to my teammate, Melissa, to walk through a user journey as well as our platform. All right, thank you so much. So, I'm gonna get us started today by telling you guys a story. Early in my career, I was approached to help someone today we're gonna protect her identity and call her Tanya. Tanya lost seven family members in Hurricane Katrina. 
She showed up to my office with her hand shaking and eyes filled with tears. She not only lost her husband, who handled all of their financing, budgets, credit, but she lost her entire support system. She was losing hope in finding a home that could provide the stability and the security that they desperately needed. She had a decent income stream using her social security benefits, but she had no credit and no understanding of how to budget. Luckily, she had me, but we didn't have Domino. Legacy systems put the landlord in control of the application and the screening process, but for individuals like Tanya, they are left with uncertainty and stress. Our product, Domino, leverages generative AI to provide a personalized expert experience for tenants that provides certainty, transparency, convenience, and it ensures that they're able to explore all of the available rental options. Domino is designed as a personalized chat and video experience where tenants can be educated on what's possible, then give permission to Domino to, get, to pull a credit report, per, perform a background check, and connect with bank accounts and verification platforms. They can even take videos to document the property condition. Once Domino gathers all of these or connects to all of these platforms, it's gonna give the consumer a readiness rating. The first rating is ready to rent. If a tenant receives this rating, they're automatically gonna receive a list of available properties in the area that meet their specific criteria. And they're also gonna highlight properties that they're automatically pre-approved for. It, uh, the tenant's gonna be able to toggle back and forth between properties with a lower price point and a higher price point than what Domino showed them originally. They're also going to be able to be um, able to, uh, to filter for landlords that report to the credit bureau. So if they have future home ownership interest in need, um, they're going to be able to connect with those properties. The second rating is you're close, but we need more information. If a tenant receives this rating, Domino is going to work with the tenant, tenant to identify the areas of risk in their application that might be mitigated with a strong explanation. And the last is we cannot proceed at this time. This rating is gonna give them specific reasons why they can't proceed. And then it's gonna suggest things that, can that they can do to help improve their rating, like exploring voucher opportunities, exploring roommate opportunities, or helping to build their credit or financial situation with the help of HUD housing counselors. For property managers, Domino is gonna provide data and authenticated pre-approved rental application based on their specific criteria a consistent screening experience, and the ease of having a standard application and lease auto-generated on their behalf. We know that leveraging generative AI to do some of the things that we're suggesting can be a little bit scary, so we're gonna walk through some ways that we've mitigated risk of hallucination and bias in the platform. We have consistent QC, user testing, and evaluations performed regularly, and all tenant data is gonna be stored in an NPI-protected environment. All right but don't just take our word for how awesome this platform is. We wanna show you what we've built. Awesome, so let's go through a couple different demos of Domino AI and how Domino AI could have helped Tanya. So Tanya's gonna go into this system uh, that is running on OpenAI's ChatGPT. Tanya's gonna say to, to Domino AI, hey, I'm looking for a property to rent, can you help? Once she, she gives permission, Domino AI is gonna pull in all sorts of different information uh, about credit history, uh, background checks, et cetera, and then produce an application for Tanya, which she can then review. Domino AI then assesses the readiness rating at almost ready to rent but needs more information and wants to understand more about a prior eviction. Once uh, Tanya is able to explain that that was due to Hurricane Katrina, but then she got back on her feet, Domino AI is able to update that application to say ready to rent up to $1,700. Once Tanya provides some search criteria of what kind of apartment she's looking for, it then produces five results that she is pre-qualified for with those landlords. Uh, and she decides to go with the first one, and Domino AI proactively offers to uh, generate uh, an email to the landlord. Uh, Tanya can then send that to the landlord, and she's, she's off to the races. Fast forward a little bit, and now Tanya has a lease agreement in hand and asks Domino AI's help to summarize this document in English and in Spanish. We've already heard today about the importance of equity around language translations, and that's certainly capable in Domino AI as well. To fast forward just a little bit though, now imagine 12 months later, Tanya's ready to buy a home, uh, and now she needs that security deposit back 
to be able to- I'm the landlord of this unit. I have my tenant with me. My tenant just wrapped up their lease. Can you please provide a damage assessment? Certainly. Comparing the before and after pictures, the after image shows very light wear and tear, which is expected from normal use. I determine there is no meaningful damage. I'm going to email this assessment document to both of you. Are you ready to release the funds on the security deposit? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. All right. So as we mentioned, this is just the beginning of what's possible. The slide up on the screen is going to show you guys what we're thinking, but I'm sure you're also thinking about what the heck happened to Tanya. So I'm going to tell you the rest of her story. Tanya was able to find an apartment to rent for six months. She was connected with a home builder in the area that was able to build her a brand new home for her family. And I was able to call her on Christmas Eve with her clear to close on her brand new mortgage. Within a span of six months, she obtained a rental, rebuilt her credit, learned how to budget, and set her family up for a brighter future with the stability and the security they desperately needed. Let's start the dominoes. Thank you, Open fall. Angels. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really glad we got to hear what happened to Tanya before that seventh domino fell. <laughs> All right, judges, off to you with questions. Great uh, use case, terrific use case. And uh, thanks for the slide on <clears throat> yeah, the audio transcript, right? So I, I think that's uh, really, really great. Uh, the question I have is, what God rays are in place to ensure that users will not use landlord information, for example, that they get to perpetuate, for example, scam, and uh, other uh, social vices. Yes, what guard dress. So yeah, Sorry. Uh, so we gotta make sure that uh, the, the, uh, the landlord information is like protected. So we'll make sure that the appropriate data governance measures are being taken uh, before we actually use the data into our platform. So, so the way it will be is both are isolated and kind of like faceless in, in, in the transaction. Just like Uber is, you kind of know there's going to be a driver coming until you're matched, and then you get more detail. So all of that is kind of hidden on both sides, not only from the property manager owner side. They don't see the tenant information. They know that the qualifications are there, and everything is ready to go until the match happens. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Will, will the um, tenants have the opportunity as the data is being, you know, they've permissioned the opportunity to go in information about them, but will they have an opportunity to review and potentially refute or whatnot? Yeah, eventually there is. There. Eventually there will be control measures uh, that will be employed, uh, which will, you know, uh, help the renters to review the information. And then, uh, although they might be able to rent, ready to rent, but eventually if they have to reject a particular offer, then eventually they could, um, that's that right. process. And one of the features is it auto generates the email to the landlord as well as the application. They'll get to review that. They're the ones who hit the send button. Yeah. So they have ultimate control before they do that. What's the business model? <laughs> okay, so, so. so there's transactions that are being there. So on the domino side, we know there's downstream implications that are highly valuable. So the reason why we chose the name Domino is if we get the lease right. It has impacts on the lending side. It has impacts on the living side. It has impacts on everything. So having that lease right will reduce or auto-generate auto rent rolls for lenders, auto-generate lease audits for lenders, and those costs that are being taken out can support doing this business model, as well as anything else that you can provide. Will it be a fee for service? We're, we're hoping it to be kind of like the fees in the matchmaking just like Uber is, so there is, it's kind of part of the, the transaction. So just to add on to that, uh, for the renters, it might be a uh, unpaid platform, but for the, on the other side uh, the, of the use case, we have the property managers right. and uh, uh, the landlords. So they thank might you be so much, Team Open Angels. Can I get a round of applause for our team? <laughs> All right, next up, we're blasting off to space. Team AI astronauts, take the stage. Good morning, my name is Megan Tidgewell with the Tidgewell Results Experience, and this is Teddy Coleman with Willow Servicing. 
Buckle your seatbelts and get ready to blast off with the A, the a, a astronauts on a journey to use generative AI to improve the preservation of borrower creditworthiness during the servicing process. Our mission is early intervention and proactive monitoring by the servicer to identify distressed borrowers and offer solutions to help them stay in their homes. This will help maintain borrower creditworthiness by potentially avoiding going into a default cycle and establish trust to last through the length of the, of the homeowner relationship. The total number of loans in the U.S. market is 83 million. The current delinquency rate is 3.94%, which translates to 3.3 million loans being delinquent. This increase is seen disproportionately in populations with more first-time homebuyers and first-generation homebuyers who are early in the financial literacy learning process. Servicers are managing large volumes of loans while adhering to strict regulations and concerned about the spend per account. Servicing costs rise significantly when a loan moves into default. According to the MBA's Servicing Operations Study and Forum Report published earlier this year, servicing costs for a performing loan were $176 annually. By comparison, servicing costs on a non-performing loan rises to $1,857 annually. Early intervention is a mutually beneficial solution to help servicers minimize costs and help borrowers maintain financial stability. Now I'll set the stage for a demonstration of our solution. The servicer is not involved during the loan origination process, and in most cases, they enter into the transaction as a stranger who has to start collecting money from the borrower once a loan closes. Late payments from a borrower can occur for a variety of reasons, ranging from accidentally losing track of a payment date to unexpected, mortgage, unexpected escrow expenses uh, to major life crises like job loss or medical issues. Borrowers may not know that they can pick up the phone and ask for help or may be too overwhelmed or embarrassed to do so. Using the Homeowner Assistance Module, or HAM, can help a servicer reach out first as an ally to the borrower. HAM would run on the first date of a missed payment. A series of questions can be configured to help identify why the borrower is late on the payment. Generative AI will search internal unstructured data and external data to help prepare a picture of borrower financial health. It will present an early intervention report with options that the servicing agent can provide to the homeowner. Let's see it in action now. Uh, so in our example, uh, Barbara Borrower is a homeowner in Ohio and she's recently lost her job. Uh, and that's caused her to fall behind on some of her mortgage payments. In our sample loan servicing module here, uh, we have standard uh, traditional structured data on the loan um, as well as um, is this, I'm not sure the video is running right now. Um, if the video were running, you would see this yeah. change and you would be able to see that within the servicing file, we have a number of documents, including closing disclosure, all of the documents generated during the loan, as well as a communication profile that includes transcripts of phone calls and uh, any text or email correspondence. Yeah, so um, yeah, so with, with these, uh, so yeah, so we have traditional um, documents on the loan as well as um, unstructured data here as well, such as an email sent in as well as a phone call with the servicing agent. Uh, in, normally, a standard agent would take a long time to understand the context of the loan right now. However, with Gen AI, we're able to stitch all this data together and answer a series of configurable questions on the loan. Um, all, as part of our model, our example, all PII has been stripped out to preserve uh, the borrower's uh, privacy as well as eliminate bias. These answers are coming in, and if we drill into one of them here, you can see uh, it's given us an answer here that the borrower is also struggling to pay their utility bills. There's a human in the loop here where it's, uh, it can be reviewed and edited to ensure accuracy as well as uh, see the citations of where the data is coming from. Once all this data is, or once the questionnaire has been filled out, we can then use GenAI again to come up with a plan on how to move forward to help this borrower. In this case, uh, we want to get them uh, back on track, uh, stay in their home, and uh, preserve their credit worthiness. This would get passed off to a human agent uh, to, to figure out the best steps forward. We'll get to addressing GenAI risk momentarily, but I'd like to talk about the contact methods and early intervention plans first. 
A servicing agent or system automation can be reaching out to the borrower before the servicer is required to by regex on the 36th day. Using the early intervention report, they can communicate with the borrower via text, telephone, or email to get the borrower back on track sooner. The early intervention plan will be generated with a focus on options to maintain home ownership and preserve borrower creditworthiness. Intervention plan options would include providing a list of HUD certified housing counselors that can educate the borrower on the mortgage process options and assist with planning for long-term financial health, as well as identification of payment options that can happen far upstream of foreclosure. The goal of the intervention plan is to ensure that the servicer is aware of viable solutions they can offer the borrower and assist in the movement to increase homeowner financial literacy. We want to make sure it's clear that the generative AI is used in the solution but not left unattended. Data privacy and bias are typical concerns when using AI. Removing the personally identifiable information from the alone before the AI reasoning starts covers both the data privacy concern and lowers the risk of implicit bias. An implicit bias example would be the AI using names to identify ethnicity and decisioning negatively because of that determination. Additionally, there is a human in the loop to review the assessment of structured and unstructured data with the ability to correct information as needed before the early intervention plan is created. In conclusion, early intervention tools using generative AI can help servicers positively impact approximately 300,000 borrowers or 10% of the borrowers in delinquency. We believe this is a cost-effective solution that can be scalable even during economic downtime and can be implemented now. So go ham today. All right, now we have three minutes for judges' questions. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, does a borrower play any role in your uh, workflow, right? So you showed, you applied your Gen AI system or engine, and then you have the um, intervention plan. What role does a borrower play to actually validate that they truly need an intervention plan? The borrower has the easy part. So this is really for the servicer to help servicers build relationships with their borrowers. The borrower just has to sit there and wait to be be asked and talked to, right? It's a tool for the servicer to help develop those relationships and build durable relationships with borrowers throughout the course of the loan servicing. Thank you. So I love the use case, um, very clear in terms of what you guys are trying to accomplish. If we take a look at just the example you guys used um, with respect to sort of anonymizing the demographics, can you talk a little bit about from where you would source the data um, how you'd ingest it and how you'd train it. Yeah, so um, I think, so we have standard structured data in the loan servicing system. We also know that uh, the more data we can provide, the better. So in our example, you know, the user has also upload, or, uh, connected their bank account. And we have other uh, information we can add in. Um, and so all those documents, PDFs, things like that, we want to strip out all the PII from that um, to help find the best path forward. So I have to admit my bias. I find this to be one of the most compelling use cases, uh, just to note it. I also think it's obviously one of the hardest, but I wonder if you all are thinking about prior call data, because you're right, the data element is so critical and the nuance and sophistication. So I don't know, do you want to opine further on like where you're bringing in the information, how you're bringing it in? Yeah, um, so obviously Gen AI works really, really well with um, unstructured data. So I think there are services already where if uh, the borrower calls in, you can basically get a full transcript of that call. And so that entire volume of data can, bas can basically be passed to um, the generative AI model. Um, currently at servicers today, right, we know there are cases where people actually have to sit and listen to those phone calls and it takes them hours to go through and, and run all the checks they need to do. And what's the overlay? I mean, yeah, one thing, you strip out the names and you don't have that kind of bias risk, but let's face it, there's a lot other additional information that will generate bias. What's the oversight that's gonna be provided to mitigate that? You have 10 seconds yeah. to answer. Shoot. Yeah, I, uh, okay, um, I think in general, right, it, our model just comes up with a recommendation, so we always then pass it off to a human agent to verify that we're actually taking the right steps forward. Beautiful, thank you. Awesome, thank you.
All right, next we have DPA2 AI. I imagine we all have a friend, family member, or may have personal experience being stuck in an endless cycle of paying extremely high rents with no ability to save money for a down payment. In fact, over 70% of first-time homebuyers struggle with down payments, but hundreds of millions of dollars in assistance funds go unused annually. Why is this? It turns out 70% of buyers who could qualify are unaware of available DPA programs. Complexities of the DPA application process can deter loan officers from considering DPA options. An unintended yet implicit bias when left to loan officers to personally determine who is in need or could benefit from a DPA program. So to address this, we bring you today DPA Navigator, our generative AI-powered down payment assistance tool designed to simplify and automate the process of identifying borrower eligibility and applying for down payment assistance. It starts with automated DPA discovery, where we use the existing MISMO data set that includes borrower characteristics and is analyzed via AUS or a direct API endpoint to comprehensively assess potential DPA availability. It then hands, that, hands those results over to the DPA application generator which creates a pre-filled DPA, DPA application with all required forms for each potential option. Another point of entry is our DPA program search, where generative AI matches borrowers with the best suited assistance programs via natural language prompts. And then we expand the data set for AI by adding a DPA provider portal and this is meant to augment existing sources like DPA1 from Freddie Mac, down payment resource, uh, but this allows us to centralize the DPA program requirements and availability to streamline the communication and collaboration process for providers. And Justin's going to explain to you how this all works. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so let's take a quick step back and look at the current state of the uh, automated underwriting systems, or AUS, and the current way lenders find potential DPA programs for borrowers. We see these are two totally disparate systems. So identifying DPA programs for borrowers is a completely manual process right now. And current DPA databases have incomplete coverage of DPA programs. So taking into account the limitations of the current system, we designed DPA Navigator to be fully integrated into the existing AUS workflow on GSE infrastructure. You can see on the left the lender, paired with the borrower's MISMO file, access DPA Navigator system in the same way they would for the existing AUS process. But now, DPA Navigator automatically takes the data used for AUS and passes it through a retrieval augmented generation-based large language model, or RAG-based LLM, to retrieve DPA programs with similar descriptions and requirements that match a borrower's profile, using vector similarity measures to remove the opportunity for typos or misspellings or miswordings to unduly leave out potential matches. The scenario generation LLM then pairs the traditional AUS results and feedback with the DPA program descriptions and requirements to generate a personalized narrative, including potential DPA programs available for the borrower. Additionally, the DPA navigator can provide an auto-generated application for certain DPA programs, further streamlining the borrower-lender experience. What this does is it levels the playing field for all borrowers by searching for and recommending potential DPA programs automatically every time an AUS run is kicked off and then shepherding borrowers through the process with these auto-filled out applications. And so additionally, because we want to make sure we expand the coverage of DPA programs in the GSC databases and make them searchable by this system, we can again utilize the power of LLMs, this time to simplify the process for DPA providers to enter their program information into the database. In addition to traditional entry, DPA providers can upload information via PDF files and website links that already contain descriptions of their programs and program requirements. This means DPA providers will not have to enter information to frustratingly complex fields or forms if they don't at the time. We can then also use LLMs to interactively verify and ask for additional data, which ensures this wider coverage of programs. So we know there are risks when implementing LLMs in generative AI into user-facing applications, so we want to cover what we see as the top risks for a system like this and how we plan to provide proper mitigations. 
So first, data privacy is a major concern when handling personal financial data and non-public information. We ensure no data leaves GSE infrastructure by utilizing a closed system with self-hosted LLMs. And this is possible by utilizing smaller open source models fine-tuned on GSE data holdings geared for these specific tasks. This also keeps, also keeps model hosting costs down for the GSEs. Uh, we mitigate hallucinations from the system in a couple different ways. So the RAG system provides citable lineage of results, grounding the LLM output only in the provided documentation and context. And additionally, we constrain the LLM outputs by providing scenarios and summaries only from those grounded results, not from natural language queries from the user. So with the data extraction LLM on the right, we safeguard against data integrity risks by building in data validation rules into the system and providing interactive data verification with feedback um, from the extraction model to make sure the data ingested follows uh, data type uh, requirements. And finally, we have to address the possibility of malicious actors trying to trick or enter spammy data into the system. We mitigate this by adding checks on any free text sections of prompts for foul language or unrelated content. We again, never allow for an LLM to directly respond to a user-generated prompt, only the prompts that are constructed by the system. So here's Josh to talk about some of the benefits. So how does this benefit lenders? By using existing workflows to deliver this DPA Navigator tool within the current line of sight of loan officers, it puts it right where they're, where they're already working. You can see mockups of DU and LPA below where DPA Navigator could be injected right into existing um, documents. We also eliminate potential barriers of bi bias, awareness, and or willingness of loan officers to consider DPA options by empowering lenders to operationalize DPA messages from the AUS findings to ensure all DPA options are considered to maximize creditworthiness and ultimately secure financing for more borrowers. But what about that friend or family member? Well, it turns out that 5.8 million renters could afford a mortgage if they just had down payment assistance. And the intervention of down payment assistance would potentially increase black and Hispanic home ownership by 1.1 million households. In summary, DPA Navigator uses Gen AI to dramatically expand home ownership opportunities, simplify complex DPA discovery and application process, <laughs> and eliminate bias and increase fairness. Thank you, Thank team. You. Thank you, team. You fit it all in. <laughs> Great work, great work. <laughs> All right, judges, off to you now. Yeah, thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, it actually reminds me uh, of uh, use cases related to emergency rental assistance program, right? So, uh, quick questions. One, do you expect a better lift uh, if you have um, DPA customized LLM model. So take all the DPA data that is out there, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of using RAG and you just train your custom LLM, do you expect a better lift? And my, follow my second question is, uh, can you speak more on the risk of malicious actors, given that the data is actually coming from trusted agencies, right? So I, I would like to know more what you're thinking about the malicious actors uh, risk. Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, we, we tried to, or the plan would be to do both of the things you're saying. So to train a model fine-tuned on the DPA uh, data that's already, that we already have, like that the D GSEs already have. So you can take DPA uh, requirements and documentation and get outputs that are reasonable and uh, generated as useful to, to users. But additionally, we wanna make sure that we can update that over time Right, and be in real time if people enter new data into the system, that's where the RAG comes in. So it's fine tuning to tune gear to a specific task of understanding what DPA requirements and descriptions look like. And then the RAG is to make sure that you're still retrieving the newest data that's entered. And again, with the, to talk about the malicious actors, that was kind of not understanding the exact way that we would require uh, trusted partners to, to log in. So say you have small municipalities and we don't, they don't necessarily want to go through a login registration process. They just say, I just want to make my DPA available for people. So if that's open for um, general users to say, I want to go in and enter something, that's where we uh, enter those checks uh, to make sure it's not something completely messy that someone's trying to mess with the system. Yeah, this is, I mean, gosh, this is going to, this could be very impactful thinking about all the challenges uh, getting into home ownership. Um, let me ask you a question particularly thinking about some of the state and local kind of DPA programs, will your product be able to share whether or not those programs have 
uh, already been oversubscribed or whether or not there is enough, still any funding there. Yeah. Right, I mean, we would like to augment, I mean, the DPA provider portal will allow them to update funding status, like when they run out of money. So some, I think 70% of DPA programs are currently funded, uh, but we would have real-time status so it could check that in real time. Um, how do you think about bias and, and protect from bias? I know you're, the data is the GSE data, but you've got the model that's working with that data. Nine seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're trying to reduce the bias of, of the entire thing by saying it's run equally the same through the AUS process for every single borrower. So Thank you, team. The same, so the same borrower, Mismo data has run across all of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the judges and the team. Round of applause. All right, next up is Team InnoFair. InnoFair, take the stage. Good morning, we are Team InnoFair. Uh, today we're going to talk to you about some concepts around increasing credit worthiness, particularly focusing on underserved populations, specifically within the area of refinance. The gap in the racial inequality in refinance is large and continually growing. Uh, black, Hispanic, and low-income individuals are refining at a rate far lower than their counterparts that are white, Asian, and high income. Our friends at the National Fair Housing Alliance have shown over the last decade roughly a 75% increase in this racial inequality gap. Despite advances in technology, despite supposedly increased awareness, this problem is getting worse and not better. We've identified three primary reasons why this occurs. Number one, black Latino consumers don't even try to get a refi. Either they're unaware or not clear of how the process works or just believe they are gonna be rejected anyway and they don't even try. Two, the initial cost can be a barrier to many, particularly if they fear they're not gonna get a fair shake in the process. Lastly, an undervaluation of the properties caused by biased appraisals uh, is leading many who have taken the plunge to not a be able to get a refi. Freddie Mac data show black and Latinos are twice as likely to receive a low appraisal, uh, further uh, exacerbating this particular issue. We want to approach this with our app, Fair Appraise. And the idea, the opportunity here is that we can mitigate bias in what is a very subjective human process and try to address that particular part of the problem. A study in 2021 identified the top 20 least diverse occupations in the U.S. Number one occupation, appraisers. Over 95% white, 70% male, definitely skews older, uh, less than 2% of them are black. Again, the opportunity to inject subjectivity in, and an influence in what should be objective is great. And that's where we think we can have an impact. By facilitating the collection of the data, thank you. We think we can go and approach two different areas here. And number one with fair appraise is what we'll call prospecting. A homeowner able to, to uh, actually get a sense of their home value on their own before they really decide whether they want to purchase a refinance. Uh, without the upfront cost being there, without a really a fear of having to dip into what an unfair market is, using this app to get a sense of where they sit. Secondly, to be used as a second opinion or a counterfactual. If they believe they have been unfairly appraised, they can use this data to go in and say, we can show that we should be getting a higher value for this house. Ultimately, we think this will help to start to slowly unbias what has been a set of biased data over history. So, what does this app look like? <clears throat> so, from an um, architectural perspective, we're using uh, standard generative AI models. It is uh, platform agnostics. Uh, we'll have a user inter uh, interaction phase, which will be the front end applications and the access management. We'll have the data ingestion. This is where all the data is going to be. It's going to be cleansed and uh, managed. It's also going to be shared with, with data from different systems. Uh, our image analysis is going to take the data and it's going to remove some uh, privacy information, personal data, maybe shoes in a corner. 
Uh, our language models are going to be the ones driving all of the context, right? So either guiding the, the end user consumer into walking through the home, um, as well as doing uh, all of the other uh, uh, necessary model uh, questions. Then we have the appraisal data generation that is going to connect with existing systems as well as different systems to, to remove bias and, uh, and come up with a, with a good valuation. And then at the end, we're going to do login and monitoring to ensure security, to ensure also that we have bias detection, and then we can continuously go through the process to ensure that we, they, that we can remove some of those biases and, and, and shorten that gap or minimize that gap. So, so how do we go through this? So the, the user will come in, it will uh, download the app, uh, we have either a user authentication, so, so get an account, or we can actually give you a guest access so that you can be anonymous within the process. Uh, the user then guided by AI in either multi-language voice or text uh, will guide you through the steps of going through your home, taking uh, images and videos as is, it is required by the system. The system will take those and analyze those, remove and filter out any information. So again, you know, shoes on a corner, uh, family photos on, on a wall, uh, and then just try to do bare bone and try to remove all of that unnecessary information. <clears throat> uh, the app continues to guide the user, collects all the data. If it needs other information, such as mechanical system uh, 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 pictures or images to determine the condition, uh, also any appliances that determine to be uh, conditions, kitchens, bathrooms, it'll go and walk you through that. And at the end, it will collect all that data, tell you whether the data is sufficient, and then process, and then give you uh, a valuation of that home, all of this without having to charge you anything. You take this and you look into the future, and by using other technologies to be able to do 3D flooring maps, um, um, et cetera, we can expand the level of, of um, appraisal data or valuation data to include even more things, so that you can do virtual walkthroughs and things like that from, from homes. Disruption is great. Uh, disruption with guardrails is even better. We've identified categories of risk in two areas. Number one, those are really a that are application specific. So how could we go wrong with this? We get bad data collected, inaccurate data collected from a house. It's incomplete. By using a number of valid and biased data sources like MLS listings, census data, actual appraiser training courses, we're able to train this model so it should be able to be, be done very accurately. Fraud by being able to geolocate on the house to know we are in the house we say we are and getting that we should suffice. Generative AI specifically, we want to make sure we have secure data sources, such as the ones I mentioned, guardrails around the topic so we keep the user on point and not have it asking who's going to win the World Series. Um, and then safety guardrails, incorrect, unresponsive answers, ensuring we are answering the questions of the homeowner and getting them directed in the right way. Lastly, we want to use ongoing monitoring and automated testing with the bot to be able to pull the answers, use retrieval automated generation from sources like the MLS to validate the answers we are getting are all correct. The business opportunity is great. During the COVID drop in rates, 1.2 million didn't even try a refi that could have qualified. Thank you. <laughs> Three minutes for judges' questions. So I uh, love the focus on appraisal equity. We've all seen the reports, the horrifying reports of, of what happens when it goes wrong. Just a question on the business model itself. Given that it's refi focused, refis are rate constrained, how do you think about what will make this compelling for an investment and who do you think that investor is? I think that investment, we get more people in the ball game right now. Again, the ones that aren't even trying for this, and something that's fairly easy to get the homeowners involved in the process. Yeah, I think for homeowners, it's confidence, right? Confidence that I can go through this process and not start paying somebody first. I think from from the lenders is qualified lead generation. Um, I also think that we focus on refinance here, but that was just the initial use case. I think the second use case is is valuation, right? So be able to, hey, I'm buying a house. I want to see if I can. If I can do this, I'm selling my house. I want to see if the appraisal is right. Should I sell now? Should I sell later? So I think there's a lot of possibility to expand the use case. Uh, I think the key is how do we start reducing the amount of money that it takes into, into these transactions to just get people that wouldn't normally get into the transaction? Yeah, thanks for uh, the presentation. So I, I think uh, in, during your presentation, you mentioned counterfactuals as one of the, uh, the biasing strategy, right? So I imagine a situation where the counterfactuals are being 
generated by Gen AI. So do you see any legal uh, or compliance issue with recommendations that are based on synthetic data generated by Gen AI? Well, this, it wouldn't be synthetic. This would be actual information that is collected from the property that we could then easily match up against what an appraiser collected. So we've got those matches to go through and see and work with GSEs and their, their credit underwriting systems. Um, legally, it would be, I, I, you know, I, uh, if you've got two sets of actual real data that can be verified and validated, I feel good about where we would be sitting with that. Um, just, just to clarify, yeah. uh, the reason I think they are synthetic is because they are counterfactuals, right? So do, do you see any legal or What is that counterfactuals? Actually, you just, here is something, we have gathered our own data here that we believe is an accurate representation of the property. Okay. So it, it is not synthetic in that respect, but that is, you know, we believe this is what the property looks like. We got this value, the appraiser came up with this. Where is the difference All right. that happened? Thank you. A quick question, I think I have 20 seconds, so I'm gonna ask it very quickly. Uh, you know, you think about the potential for more refis that suggest higher prepayment speeds. What is? What do you think about in terms of the ecosystem of regulators, uh, not just housing, but you start to think about Treasury, start to think about the Fed, OCC, in terms of stewarding the overall economy? Uh, a big change overall. You know, we're putting more money back in the pockets of people and then working its way back up there. So we've got... Um, All right, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, team. Thank you. All right, everyone, you'll be thrilled to know that Lawrence and I are doing such a good job that we are ahead of schedule. We are. So we're going to put on a show for you, too. <laughs> not seven minutes. Not seven minutes. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, the first six presentations that you just heard, their consumer experience and assessing creditworthiness. We're now gonna take a break. It's gonna be seven minutes, so now you're on the clock. It's your chance to go over and talk to the person next to you, talk about those use cases, stretch your legs, and we're gonna start on the dot because we're sticklers for time. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, thank you. We are now ready to press on with our next six presentations. Side yeah. side. Just, well, we're, we're really excited to start again. We've got six exciting presentations coming up. Now, you heard consumer experience. You heard assessing credit worthiness. We're now going to hear our use cases for operations and risk and compliance. Our next team up is Team Mortgage Minds. Team Mortgage Minds, take it away. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Matt Tully. I'm joined this morning by Sam Oliver on behalf of Team Mortgage Minds. We appreciate the opportunity to be presenting today. So we tried uh, a couple different ways to t tackle uh, problems. We looked at operations. We looked at compliance. We ultimately uh, landed on the operations. And you know, one of the things I think all of us know in mortgage is there's a lot that you have to absorb when it comes to regulations, both federal and state, investor guidelines, agency guidelines. There's a lot of information to take in. And it creates a lot of challenges for both lenders and servicers when it comes to scaling, when it comes to uh, bringing new uh, members into the workforce, especially diverse uh, populations into the workforce. There's a lot that you have to overcome and learn. And if you ask me or any one of us, how did you learn this? You know it takes a lot of time. So the solution or the challenge we were trying to figure out is how do we, how do we scale up and make that happen faster? Thank, sorry. Thanks, Matt. And it is daunting. There's lots of uh, logos on there, lots of labels, lots of arrows, lots to know, lots to understand. So how do you solve it? Well, we have the answer. It's our friendly mortgage mind AI. This is the, uh, this is the benevolent AI, not some evil machine. It's, uh, it's our happy guy who is our virtual assistant for mortgage professionals throughout the life cycle of the loan and throughout the mortgage industry. You know, it's a great use case for generative AI where you can consume all those large, complex documents, you know, thousand plus page handbook, you know, the selling servicing guide of the GSEs, the Reg X, Reg Z, you know, FCRA, ECOA, on and on on the regulation front, state regulations. Feed that into our friendly mortgage mind AI, create this knowledge base, and it is the virtual assistant for the mortgage professional. 
Think about the um, you know, origination uh, participants, the underwriters, the LOs, the processors, uh, even in the closing space. Think about the servicing call center reps. Think about the uh, uh, special point of contacts uh, who have to help borrowers through the loss mitigation and having all of that information at their fingertips so that they actually are effective, can serve you know, the customer, serve the consumer, be efficient and reduce costs and really um, get better answers sooner, not just by searching and getting links that you have to read and interpret and understand, but actually getting uh, near real-time answers from our friend Mortgage Mind AI is uh, a much more effective way for mortgage professionals to serve consumers. Here's just a real quick example in a demo that we built uh, that we wanted to show you. See our little buddy down there in the corner, uh, you know, uh, and a question has come up here. Uh, it's around an FHA loan and underwriters thinking, um, you know, do I need to get a, a credit report in this file? I don't see one for a non-borrower spouse. And so do a quick search. Um, they find out from the handbook that no, you only need it in community property states. And, you know, that's great. But, you know, there might be other questions that our friend Mortgage Mind AI kind of prompts and gives you that information. Um, and what we think is very important is providing links in case uh, that mortgage profess professional wants to reference the, you know, the source document, be able to pull that up and see that there um, so that they know that it really is a legitimate answer and they have access to that if they need it. But it makes them that much more effective. We, you know, there are dozens of use cases in the origination space and in the servicing space as well, but this was just a pretty straightforward one we wanted to show today. Um, what, are the, what are the benefits to this? Well, you know, we think that there are a lot of benefits um, across the industry. Quantitatively, you, know, you can look at, at a very discrete use case, um, like a servicing call, uh, call center, and you know, uh, enabling an agent to be more effective at answering questions, tracking down information for a borrower who might be calling in around a question around a, a late fee or a payment change or what, uh, you know, what options they, they might have or what you know, regulations apply here. The agent is able to go in and search using Mortgage Mind AI and go get information that would save the agent uh, and the consumer a couple minutes uh, on about a quarter of the calls that they receive. That translates to about $16 million across the industry. If you think about the origination space, if we were able to avoid escalation of issues, delays due to questions, not knowing how to proceed, et cetera, during the origination process, we think we could reduce um, the non-LO comp side of the cost to originate by about 5%. Um, apply that across the number of units that the industry did in 2023, that's uh, almost $2.8 billion in savings and efficiencies across the industry. Um, but that's, not, that's just sort of the quantitative benefits. Qualitative benefits, it's all around serving the customer and doing it as efficiently and effectively as possible, right? Allowing the people to focus on service rather than uh, research, delays, et cetera, and it really makes a difference um, whether that's, you know, the underwriter being more responsive to the processor on what needs to be gathered in origination or getting the answer for the servicer. Industry, Matt touched upon it, expediting that training time. You can ramp up and ramp down resources. The business is cyclical. You know, you might have a refi environment one moment. You might have to deal with a natural disaster and servicing another moment and being able to train those resources and, and ramp them up and make them effective is important. And then lastly, helping to highlight differences across regulations or investor guidelines could be another benefit as well. With that, I'll let Matt talk a little bit about the risks and controls. Thanks, Sam. So um, obviously, there's with any use of AI, there's always going to be some some risks and, and some controls. Um, you know, the top two ones that we identified are uh, one, you have a you have an answer that's I, either high in, in confidence but is is somewhat ambiguous, or uh, two, the answer is incomplete. 
the LLM as we envision it is really based on the industry guidelines. And so by using human-centered machine in the loop learning, uh, we can allow the, the, the human to provide feedback. Yes, this answer was helpful. No, it wasn't helpful. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that ties in actually with, with one of the last Chris, which is people thinking of this as legal advice. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of disclaimers and things that would have to go into this, but the idea is I'm using this to get an answer to then you know, further my understanding or bring it to a professional internally uh, to get further clarification. That's it. Beautiful, thank you. Oh, shout out to the team. Oh yeah, sorry. Shout out to our team who's in front here. <laughs> hey guys, great. Um, is this one? There we go. Um, great use case. I think you know the one thing that the mortgage industry does, whether it's acronyms or or guidelines, right? Is it, it makes things very complicated. There are solutions out there. Some are commercial. Some the GSEs have Ask Poly or their their underwriter call desk. Do you envision this being embedded in that or a separate? Uh, a separate service. Let me take that. You want? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think some of the solutions out there are limited, right? You might have something that just focuses on underwriting, right? Um, Ask Polly is great for the Fanny guide, right? Um, many of those solutions also just give you um, what I will call the links to the documents and shows you the big thick paragraph that you have to read through and interpret, etc. Um, this would have everything sort of in one place and would give you that answer that's generated by mortgage, uh, mortgage mind AI um, rather than just being a single, what we'll call, you know, agency, uh, you know, or, or um, uh, investor solution. And I think maybe just the part of where you're getting with your question is the, what is the model? We came, you know, what we envisioned here was a kind of an industry utility. Right, so you can, you can buy into it, you can put equity into it, you can pay a user fee, and, and then your, your organization gets access to it. You can go pure government, you can go pure private. We, we kind of landed in, in the middle in terms of having a level of flexibility. Obviously, the benefit is the more people that are involved, the better the, the, the learning gets uh, as more people are providing feedback. So your um, benefit around the opportunity to identify potential inconsistencies across guidelines and regulations really jumped off the page at me. Can you talk a little bit more about how it would do that, how it would highlight those, and so forth? Yeah, so, yeah sure, I'll, I'll take that one. So if you think about uh, an example and one that I'm very familiar with, uh, cancellation of private mortgage insurance. You have the Homeowners Protection Act that says you have to do a certain number of things, and then you have agency guidelines that say something different. And then if you want to throw FHA in the mix right now, you can't cancel FHA at all. So helping someone who's in a, a servicing operations center, for instance, understand, well, what are the circumstances under which I can or cannot cancel based on what the statute says versus based on what the investor guideline says. Uh, you have similar issues around things like uh, lender place insurance requirements from an investor standpoint versus what Reg X says there will, you have to do in terms of notices and things like that. So it's really helped, the idea would be to help the, the operator understand where there's kind of overlaps or, or different language about what you have to do. Obviously the federal statutes um, take precedence, but then the investor guidelines are just as important for the operator in terms of their counterparty relationship with the agencies. So it would, it would flag when the, those inconsistencies along the way? Correct, and, the and to understand where they are specifically so that you have, as you make a decision, you can know what you have to do. All right, thank you. All right, Thanks. thank you. All right, coming up to the stage, we have Team Fair. Good morning, <clears throat> and thank you, FHFA, for hosting this event, guiding us, and feeding us. We are we are team fair. Our problem statement is at the confluence of operational efficiency and risk management. Specifically, oops. Questions? Rather, which one is it? I got it. Thank you. Apologies for that. 
Um, so like I said, our use case is at the confluence of operational efficiency and risk management, specifically fraud in multifamily. We have all seen fraud in our personal lives and our professional lives. We know that it's always lurking around the corner. And with market stresses, various market dynamics, as well as the availability of uh, Gen AI, it becomes um, more and more easier for fraudsters to, to kind of perpetrate fraud. And that is actually shown through data, whether it's increasing in, increase in SAR filings over the past two years, or the anticipated increase in DQ rates is all um, why it makes this use case all the more important. The traditional methods in the multifamily lending, or even single family lending for that matter, uh, relies on manual, rigid, rules-based um, evaluation of documents, deal level or transaction level analysis, and just limited experience. And oftentimes, fraud is not detected until after the fact when money has already left the door. And this is where we believe Gen AI comes in and helps us significantly improve the solution and the ability to detect and even prevent fraud. Because Gen AI allows us to correlate vast amounts of data, documents, images, and be able to um, not, only, not only identify and analyze the data, but also generate recommendations and next best actions that we can move forward with. And Matt will help us uh, walk us through the solution in more detail. Sure. <clears throat> So it, it, it's not a level paying, playing field. It turns out that creating fraud is a little bit easier than detecting and analyzing fraud. And it's quite open-ended, it's nuanced, it adapts. Uh, there's different tactics that evolve. Um, but this isn't a problem that hasn't been attempted to be addressed before. It's very it's been addressed human in nature, very laborious. I can't speak firsthand because I don't know if I could do that job. It's too hard. <laughs> But um, there has been complementary technology that's been attempted on the side as well, but that hasn't really done enough to help alleviate the burden on uh, that laborious human intensive process, mainly because rules engines or models might be too rigid. They're not open-ended enough, they're not adaptive enough. So we see in specifically in the underwriting space, uh, looking at financial transactions and other information, generative AI is that complementary tool that can help where other technology hasn't been able to help before. And that includes authenticity of documents, that includes anomaly detection within documents, but also across documents, and then just also doing it in an intuitive way and summarizing it so that it's understandable and accepting more open questions and being more interactive. This is a mock of what we're thinking. Um, the, the UI, uh, we're taking a look at, there's, there's different contexts for different uh, cases, and that ability to personalize and look at it more flexibly uh, through generative AI um, is, is quite helpful. And then from a detection perspective, not only can generative AI help with detection, but it can help inform what the next recommended, recommended task or action is, and do that in a way that's understandable to the audience that's asking the question. And so how it works, I think this is more of a focus on the data and the model. We know that the efficacy of the model uh, is important. You need to make the right recommendations. You can have false positives and false negatives. So in our, our thought was that we would partner initially with a lender with a fair bit of financial information, uh, financial statements, examples of you know, different packages, and use that either directly to see if that can appropriately train the model or run it through synthetic data to generate further data. Additionally, and that could be used to train predictive models, we don't see that that's uh, something that won't fit, but specifically we think to fine tune uh, generative models to, to help with um, um, that type of interaction that we desire. There's also, we, we see that the, we have to be able to adapt. We can't just take empirical historical data. We wanna take a look at, can we simulate the environment? Can we simulate what a loan looks like? Can we take different bad actor profiles and have them be given those situations and come up with their own ways of uh, committing fraud and see if we can't be ahead of uh, where, where, where fraud um, might be in the future. And so as far as risk and controls, um, we looked at it from a lot of different angles. Um, we know that fairness is important and that probably applies to the borrower. Um, we actually, and this wasn't necessarily intentional, but the use cases that we're looking at uh, don't have obvious uh, borrower information. We're looking predominantly at the financial transactions. If we were to extend to look at more of the 
the buyer profile, um, we would want to be considerate of the model selection, the training, the tuning, and having all the guardrails that are appropriate to understand, manage, and, and, and evolve um, our ability to combat that, any sort of bias that's there. From a privacy perspective, we've talked about whether it's encryption of data, those are financial transactions, they're not necessarily privacy information, but um, they're commercial, or they are private, commercially sensitive in nature, and we want to either redact, use synthetic data, or mask them in some capacity um, before being included in models or potentially in responses to, to questions and answers. From an accuracy perspective, I tried to cover a little bit of that. That's always going to be an evolving set of tactics that we would deploy to make sure that the efficacy of what we're doing is there while also adhering to non-negotiable things like fairness. And from an explainability perspective, um, traditional approaches to that uh, model selection, how we train and how we tune, we will have a human in the loop that helps to uh, shepherd this through the overall process before anything action is taking place, a SAR report or any sort of communication back to the borrower. And then also just having control from a prompt perspective, uh, looking to see if we can control and mitigate risk in that capacity. Thank you. And finally, um, like we said, we are solving for operational efficiency and risk mitigation, and when you solve for those two, you get cost efficiencies. It opens up liquidity, it potentially reduces the need for lost reserves and just opens up that liquidity, like I said, to lend more and close the home ownership gap. Thank you. All right, thank you, team. Thank you. <laughs> All right, judges. So this is really uh, interesting, thank you. Uh, so some of the challenges, especially lower income underserved populations are, they are non-traditional and that manifests in the data about them. And we're embarking on this opportunity for using much more dynamic models to better discern, are you really the risk that more traditional data would present? And so I hear you, you're not looking necessarily at the borrower information, but how are you thinking about the training in the evaluation and even piloting so that you are making sure you're not putting in place both the use of existing data that create enormous false positives for underserved populations and then deploying the dynamics of the LLMs that get you in a much better place for accuracy, both for inclusion, but also mitigating costs with fraud. Sure, so um, like most things with Gen AI, test, test, test is going to be the model. And <clears throat> a, a solution like this, you can implement it in line as a pre-underwriting step, or you can run it your entire servicing book through it, right? So looking at, looking at that vast majority of data, and like Matt said, a small mom and pop lender might not be a good use case for this. A larger lender, a larger servicer, including GACs that have these large amounts of data, we could actually leverage it to train the model to evaluate for false positives and negatives and then uh, verify the accuracy of the models. I would just argue you want the small mom and pop who are dealing with the non-traditional as well as the large. Yes, so, so your so pool is bigger. You're absolutely right. But the initial training of the data and the LLMs, we probably need more data before we go out to a small mom and shop. And just to make sure, and uh, I'm not from the, the housing space. Are you asking in context generally, we're specifically multifamily, is that change a bit of the nature of that question at all? Just the it? data element and how important it is for inclusion. Sure. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, fraud may be considered to be a realization or instance of uh, deep fakes, right? And Gen AI is one of the leading drivers of deep fakes, misinformation, disinformation. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on using a tool that can drive deep fakes, misinformation, to also assess uh, fraud instances, especially in housing. It almost like fire, you need fire to fight fire, right? Mm -hmm. So you need, you need a tool and a technology like Gen AI to actually be able to understand what the capabilities are and solve for that. It's not, it's not an easy answer, it's not an easy solution that you can say, let's throw Gen AI or an LM and it's going to do it. It's going to take time, it's going to take a lot of testing, and it's going to take a lot of data to really get better at it. Well, Thank you. You don't have to only use Gen AI. So Gen AI may be able to produce fraudulent, but uh, predictive might be better at determining if that generative AI content is, is fraudulent, for example. Thank you, team. Thank you, judges. A round of applause for our team. Thank you. All right, next on the stage is team Sin Savants.
Now, are you ready, Sin Savants? We're All right. Ready. Go for it. Sin Savants here, Eric and Brittany. The mortgage market is operating suboptimally with regard to risk and compliance. We are not using all of the data that we can to reduce risk and ensure compliance. Today's access to data is restricted to preserve privacy, preventing the ability to fully leverage for the greater good. As shared during opening remarks on day one of our sprint, Lori Goodman mentioned a lack of data hinders AI. We want to unlock access to the vast data sources that exist today. We need a way to provide availability and access to the data while keeping privacy protection in place. Of the many areas we can explore on access to data and leveraging Gen AI to help us solve for these gaps, let's focus our conversation on repurchases. Let me go back one. Yeah. Repurchasing impacts are staggering. In 2023, approach nearly one billion in volume. How can we help support lenders reduce the amount of scratch and dents inadvertently submitted? How do we identify when there are fraudulent transactions? How can we train people in feed systems, models to be able to learn and recognize? What if there's a place for lenders to have access to this data where emerging fraud trends can be reviewed proactively? Imagine a magical place of being able to harness the benefit of data to enhance our processes, reduce our risk, and continue to proactively adhere to compliance measurements. All of these use cases and questions can be solutioned with access to the data that GSEs already have today. However, data privacy restricts the sharing of this information. We propose to solve through generative AI. And while today the industry has done a tremendous job of documenting guidelines, requirements, and a variety of data sources, we still have loan quality issues. New technology allows us to take this to the next level. But there's more we can do with tools like Gen AI. Before we dig into the details of a new tool, let's have a quick review of the precedents that have been set already. As we lean into what has come before, we propose today the next iteration of industry sharing and data access. Eric, so glad you're here today to share with us the next phase using Gen AI. Thank you, Brittany. So what our solution has is effectively a digital twin of the mortgage market using synthetic data. What we propose to do is to publish both historical structured and unstructured data out to the marketplace. What I mean by structured, it's kind of the data you see in Excel. There's rows and columns of data. When I talk about unstructured, it might be things like images, it could be a bank statement, and so on and so forth. However, because of privacy regulations, we can't take that data and just give it out to the marketplace. If it was there, people could be training models based on that. So what we propose to do is use generative AI to create synthetic data that looks and feels like real data, but obviously preserves privacy. That'll reduce repurchases, that'll improve QC, and also provide an opportunity for us to better train people in the industry. So let's dive a little bit deeper. What do we mean by synthetic data? Synthetic data is not just masking someone's social number with stars or changing everyone's address to one main road. It's about looking at the data, understanding the correlations of the data, the distribution of the data, and creating synthetic data that looks and feels like real data, but preserves privacy. And that's done in, in quantitative data using generative AI. So it's not just, you know, you know out, out in the sky. There are people talking about it. There are people using it. Uh, there's a paper by JP Morgan about using synthetic data. Uh, NVIDIA, one of the sponsors here, talks about the use of synth synthetic data. And in fact, Gartner talks about, by 2030, the majority of data used to train models will be synthetic rather than real data. There's a, a financial organization, SWIFT, which is the counterparty, the, the consortium owned by the banks for wire transfers. They're using synthetic data to do anti-fraud modeling. They've taken the real data, create synthetic data out of it, and they're training models based upon that. So it is being done, and we propose to do it in the mortgage space. So what does a high-level architecture look like? Well, the data we have today, the structured and unstructured data that's sitting in the GSE, we apply a generative AI process to create synthetic data. And then we have a red bounded box. That red bounded box is one of our control points. 
That's where the GSE looks at the data, confirms we're preserving privacy, pres you know, confirming the data is accurate, and that can be done in an automated, quantitative way. There are mathematical models that allow you to compare both your synthetic data and your real data to make sure that they match in terms of distribution, in terms of efficacy of models, and so on and so forth. There's a, a human re review of this. Human reviews it, says, yes, this is okay, and it gets released. Where does it get released to? Depending upon the GSE, it's their data, they can release it to a public source such as data.gov, or they can do a, a gated approach where it's sitting in one of their data portals for an entitlement and to be subscribed to. It can be done for free, it could be done with a charge, it's entirely up to the GSE how they want to do it. And then the, the consumers, the originators, the vendors, the, uh, the quants, the data modelers, and everybody else can take this. They can use that to improve their software processes. They can do it to improve their training, because now they have real, you know, albeit with synthetic, but bank statements that match tax documents, that match uh, lending documents, and so on and so forth. And it's done at scale. So there's obviously risks associated with this, and we've highlighted a few here. Key one, obviously, is data privacy and browser re uh, uh, borrower re-identification. Re so we'll be removing key identifiers such as social. It's not needed as part of this process, okay? There's human review points in this as well. Again, quantitatively, mathematically done. Uh, we don't want to perpetuate bias. So the data we're releasing can be data that is not biased. So we don't want to create synthetic models based on biased data, so we're not going to include that. And there's other uh, controls and risks that we highlight here. So by liberating the data, we're reducing risk, improving compliance for a number of stakeholders throughout the mortgage industry. Open it up for questions. Yeah, so when it comes to uh, algorithmic discrimination, one of the biggest challenges is uh, data uh, representation. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that Gen AI can be used to create synthetic data to address that problem. Uh, but when it comes to enforcement, right, so there are other controls that need to be in place. So what are your thoughts on guard rays or safety measures that should be in place when using data that does not represent real people in housing to cause real impact on people? Do it. Like ethical controls that you think should be in place. Well, I think there's two sides of this. One is that uh, you could be modeling what bias looks like, okay, as part of this aesthetic data set that says this is bias. And therefore, people could be building software and training processes and so on that ident better identify bias and say, this is, you know, did your systems track and, and capture that this is a biased, you know, application? Uh, an alternative, and the other side of it, I would say, is that we don't need to include biased data in the synthetic data set. So it would be an ideal state where there is no bias in the world, and that could be what people are modeling on in terms of training their systems as well. If that addresses your question. Yeah, thank you. That, thank that, that's you so love the, uh, love the use case. Um, just can you comment on the trend of repurchases over time? Is it going up or going down? Um, and then I, I love the sort of historical look back on the different um, you know, data advances that we made. But I also think there have been some around, you know, data validation, and I didn't see that up there, and I'm wondering if that has played a role in this or how you think about, um, you know, lenders using data validation to get um, the benefit of rep and warrant relief. Sean on our team is going to address the... Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so repurchase volume in recent years, it's decreased. So that the number quoted for 23 was, I think, approximately half that for 22, 22 and that's that's really scaled with volume so it, uh, I guess we'd anticipate for this year it would be decreased again and potentially the next year and then it would it would increase so scaling with with volume is the answer to the first question I don't can you repeat the, the second part of the question please yeah I was just curious that with the some of the recent you know last five years rollout of data validation tools for rep and warrant relief have they not had the impact that um, we expected. The, in terms of the 
at the relative rate rather than the absolute dollar amount, there, I believe there has been a decrease from the, the data we looked at. But to give you some concrete figures. Got to cut you off. I'm so uh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to say one thing. The repurchase is just Tw one. 20 year. bips is the answer <laughs> uh, for last year. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yep. All right. Next is Team Requiem. Uh, good morning, and thank you for your time and attention today. We are Team Requiem. Requiem is also our product name, and we're focused on a problem that the mortgage industry has had for quite some time. We have an inelastic business model. That business model has created recently some troubling and unsustainable numbers. You know, as reported by the MBA, it's a $13,000 cost to originate a loan. On top of that, I don't know if you saw the ICE white paper several months ago, it's $1,100 cost to cure. That cost to cure is broken out between $128.50 in actual fees and over $900 in labor costs to remediate, right? Our objective with Requiem is to eliminate that cure cost and participate in lowering the cost to produce a loan. Because of those high costs, other problems manifest themselves. Some underserved borrowers who qualify for a mortgage don't get them. With Requiem deployed, they will. Some lenders originate loans with appraisal bias. With Requiem deployed, that won't happen. Some lenders have policies and procedures that are in direct contradiction to regulation. With Requiem deployed, that won't happen. Thank you. So what is Requiem? Glad I have my, side, my sidekick here. Uh, Requiem is real-time inspection and evaluation of the mortgage origination process that provides actionable insights and accountability for remediation during the origination process, right? So why is now the right time for Requiem? First and foremost, most of our interactions are digital. Whether I'm on a phone call, whether I'm looking at data, or I'm receiving documents, all of that's already been digitized. The second thing is, AI allows for the reversal of that quality last approach we've embraced for years. Instead of quality last, we're going to be doing real-time inspection of the loan manufacturing process, including borrower interactions, loan data, and documents. With Requiem, both lenders and borrowers benefit. These high origination costs unfortunately impact small balance mortgages and non-traditional underserved communities. And these communities are, uh, are impacted most severely. With Requiem, we'll enable a turnaround here. Before we jump in, I want my partner Brian to tell you how it works. Thank you, Jim. Um, so this is how we imagine Requiem to work. We create an open source mortgage specific LLM trained on regulations, investor data, and mortgage products. We then create a company specific uh, deployment of that LLM onto the company's private cloud or on-prem. We, tr we train the company-specific deployment on our company policies and company procedures. The output of that company-specific LLM is not your standard human-to-text interface. Instead, it outputs a set of rules that are fed into a rule engine. These rules would be validated by a human-in-the-loop process that would further reinforce the training of the company LLM. Uh, into the rules engine, we, re we feed real-time data from phone conversations, SMS, email, chat, and loan updates. The rules are designed to run against real-time data and ensure adherence to company policy and procedures in the various interactions that lender personnel would encounter. From the rules engine, we can trigger real-time alerts and audit log tasks based on whether uh, those rules are validated or not. This enables the system to be hyper-fast and provide real-time feedback to personnel uh, as conversations and loan changes are taking place. Thanks, Brian. All right. So. This is how we imagine Requiem to work. Forgive me. And, and how we're going to deploy it. So we see, first and foremost, 
4,500 mortgage lenders across the United States acting consistently against regulations, against their internal policies, procedures, and against investor guidelines. We're going to show you a demo about real-time detection between a salesperson and a borrower, ensuring the borrower gets the right loan. Then we're going to show you another demo that's what we call offline of absorbing a document and detecting uh, loan quality issues. So go, let's go ahead and dive in. Brian, why don't you go first? So in this demo, we're seeing an employee view of a real-time phone conversation taking place between an LO and a borrower. Early in the conversation, the borrower mentioned that they're a veteran. The LO will fail to offer them a VA product and instead suggest an FHA loan. The AI will detect that they weren't offered the right product and will prompt the LO to mention the VA product. In addition, the AI prompts uh, contain quick action buttons for helping the LO check the borrower's eligibility and running uh, VA pricing. With the assistance of the Requiem AI, we're able to help ensure the borrowers offer the products that they have the right to access. Great. Thanks, Brian. So what you're looking at here is generative AI that's absorbed and interrogated a document. If you look at the right-hand side of the screen, these are pre-engineered prompts. Behind each one of these pre-engineered prompts are another 50 prompts that ensure the right guidance and inspection of the documents against the data. We've also, the red and, the, uh, the red and green are pass-fails. So when underwriters looking at this, and their collateral analysis has been significantly streamlined. The other important thing, the first thing it detected, question, no sign of appraisal bias based on comparable sales. Well, hell, that failed, and it's giving you the reason why that failed. And it does that not only with failures, but also with passes, so we have a completely auditable solution. No innovation and no change comes without risk. Top two, data privacy. Brian already explained to you how we're addressing data privacy. We've got a separate lender-specific LLM deployed where their borrower data is today, so we are not increasing that risk profile. Our separate mortgage-specific LLM, which does not contain any borrower data, is available to all in a hosted cloud uh, presence. Hallucinations, we've showed you how we cater to that as well. We keep a human in the loop for both passing and failing tests, and we provide reference information back to the reason why it's passing or failing. In terms of ROI, it's really important for lenders to get to that quickly. That's why we have a day one solution. On day one, you can get that mortgage-specific LLM, then we do the custom integrations to your data like your phone logs. Take a look up on the slide. Look for your persona, and this is how we see the extensibility of Requiem into the future. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Team Requiem. Judges, off to you. So, um, thank you. Great, great presentation. What, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the controls. You had some really good ones up there, but um, it and as you were talking about how the process would work, you talked about how the um, you'd be the first part of the process is leveraging a mortgage-specific LLM that's open from open source. Could you talk to some of the risks that would come with leveraging open source and bringing that into the process and how those would be controlled? Sure. sure. So. Uh, standard open source uh, uh, procedures usually necessitate review in terms of what's going in and, and how it's being evaluated. And you have to put uh, test criteria in place in order to ensure that the outputs of what uh, the LLM produces is what's expected. So it's so very important to, to manage it from, uh, from that perspective and have that kind of process in place that's uh, governed by you know, a more open body. The, the other thing to highlight here too, though, is because it's independent of, uh, and it's the basis for the company LLM that's brought in, during that process of actually bringing it, um, bringing it in, there's an assessment, there will be an assessment done of how it compares to uh, the company's policies and highlight differences between those two things. So it's an adoption process that allows for it to ensure that what's coming out is accurate uh, and that the, the company agrees with uh, what's produced. Uh -huh. Yeah, so th thanks for the presentation. So real-time monitoring uh, is a hard problem, and it looks like you have a strong team to actually tackle a hard problem. But not only that, it's also an expensive problem, right? So uh, can you share like a, an estimate of additional cost that you think can come from uh, the use case that you have here? 
and what, uh, again, uh, uh, measures should be in place to make sure that the additional cost is not passed off onto consumers as a, a extra burden. Yeah, I, I, so I think you're, you know, asking about the additional cost that's going to be laid on this for lenders. So first and foremost, I think, you know, we mentioned the term, it's inelastic. So we want to provide an elastic solution that's perhaps on a charge per transaction where you're leveraging the service over and over again throughout the life cycle of the loan. Okay. In terms of the control measures, uh, Brian, do you, want, do you want to answer that? Well, one thing I want to add is when we're looking at the numbers um, for the average bank, uh, the large bank, is costing you about $100 million. So when we think about the cost to do the live monitoring, it's going to be a small fraction of that. So it's in their best interest to invest in that to reduce that overall $100 million they spend in risk and control. All right, thank you, team. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Round of applause for our team. All right, next up, we have team Neural Neighbors. So I have a question for you. You've heard a lot of great uh, consumer-facing applications today. And let's say it was available. They were all available on the market. It met your business need. You had budget. Why aren't you implementing it? Who might be in the way? Who might have a question or two for you? Maybe compliance? Maybe? Um, you know, I think there might be some questions about how can you be sure of the controls that these different teams put in place? Yes, they're all controlling for risk, but how do we know? So that's what we are here to approach from Neural Neighbors with our solution. Um, so just to kind of illustrate what we're trying to avoid, this is an example of something that might happen today. So let's say you go onto any mortgage lender's website and they, oh great, they have a chatbot we can talk to. That'll help me at 3 a.m. when I'm off work. So I, I talk to them and I say, hey, I need to get my loan approval up. And uh, the mortgage bot, it's trying to be helpful. So it says, hey, what about a higher debt to income ratio? That'll get your numbers up, all right? So, you know, it's kind of funny, but that could happen because they're trying to meet the need, all right? And LLMs are non-deterministic. They're very hard to dynamically control for. And if everyone is trying to build compliance and if everyone is trying to solve this, that is wildly inefficient. So that's why we have common standards. That's why we have an AUS. Those are why we have some of those rails that other solutions are built on. So let's talk about PACE, the Precision AI Compliance Engine. So we see this as an industry-sponsored solution uh, led by an FHFA consortium. And it's going to have a couple of main factors. One is also is obviously reducing the barrier to AI adoption. Because whether you're a multinational or you're a community bank in Iowa, you're going to have the same questions about compliance. So this is going to essentially uh, reduce the barrier to entry. Now, beyond AI-generated text, so beyond what the AI is creating, we see this as also being eligible for any text. So any kind of emails being sent to your customer, if you have a live agent chatting, this is any text is going to be available at launch. So what are the benefits? Well, by reducing the cost of compliance matched with the advantages we know from generative AI, we see some real savings. One of our other teams called out the figure of twelve dollars to $13,000 to originate a loan. So if you're able to bring that down and then back out of your costs, everything that you're planning for down the road investigations, audit compliance, what can you pass along to the borrower? And that's where we see an estimate of 25 basis points being able to get passed on to that end borrower in a lower rate. We also see it as being able to not only decrease AI-induced bias, but also just natural human bias. Uh, it's like a co-pilot for you, you know, as you are uh, engaging with your customer, to be able to have a kind of a second chance. Hey, are, are you sure? Like when you send a message, do you want to recall that? Um, and it would be accessed via, via an API. So this is an integration with your existing tools. So let's look at a similar situation, but now PACE is on the case, all right? So 
Different question, how do my disability payments, how are those gonna affect my ability to get a mortgage? So we see a proposed response from your LLM. You know, let's say you've adopted one of these earlier tools. It runs by our compliance engine and gets a binary classification, pass, fail. Well, that answer is in line with, you know, housing law, so that gets passed on to the consumer. And let's see, smiley faces, they love it, all right? Uh, very effective answer here. And that whole transaction here, oh, uh, that whole transaction is logged. So that is gonna be encrypted, signed, and included in the LOS for eventual audit. And that file is not accessible to anyone except for the regulator and compliance. So if the audit does come, when the audit does come, you have an artifact to pass along directly to reduce that cost of compliance. Now let's go back to that previous example here. All right, so can I increase my amount of loan pre-approval? Let's see how it goes. Uh, any mortgage helper says, hey, what about a higher debt to income ratio? Let's try that. All right, uh, no, no, we're saying no. That does not align with our company values. It does not align with federal housing laws. So what is we gonna say? Please hold to be connected. So we are gonna maintain that relationship. The consumer is never gonna have that negative experience. And that same uh, tra uh, transaction is gonna be logged so we can let that company know, hey, your bot might be due for a tune-up. All right, so how does it work? Why is it different? So you are still maintaining the relationship with the customer. We are an API integration. So our value add is that we are an LLM orchestrator agent. We are using a fine-tuned large language model that knows the housing industry. So when we talk about points, it's about interest rates, not football, all right? It's not gonna be relied on, though, for current information. That is coming from the existing data sources the seller guides, agency documentation, and those are actually all the states that have their own rules. And maybe in the future, there's some published APIs that we can also call. So PACE is the trusted third party to validate these transactions and create the secure artifact for future audit. Um, we know the mortgage industry, and by using an agentic hybrid RAG architecture, we're able to stay on top of changes as they happen and give you the right classification. Let's talk about risks and controls. We've segmented this into responsible AI and then generative AI security for, uh, for responsible AI. What about the risk of false, ne uh, false negatives, false positives? So our policy for that is we are gonna retain 48 hours of anonymized sample data for human review and data quality at review. Skipping down to generative AI security and staying with that same example of our 48 hour review, you see LLM six and nine, those are coming from the OWASP top 10, which is kind of the industry standard for generative AI security. So for that, we are actually not gonna store beyond those 48 hours. And we are gonna reduce the attack uh, area that we have by minimizing our, our uh, storage. And uh, it works. Um, we actually have a working prototype here. What we've did is we developed 20 test cases of different strings that we would pass to the compliance engine and ask it to classify it binary. Is it clear or is it a violation and why? And you're gonna see here a video loop of three of those examples. Um, and we were able to achieve 100% correct classification over our 20 test cases. So uh, we can form a line in the back for any early adopters. So, all right, thank you. So I'll go first. Uh, thank you, really interesting, and it's been on my mind. Where are the regulators in all of this? Because clearly, they're gonna have to be adopting, and you're basically giving them a point to bring expectations to the table. How are you gonna get them actually really working with you to, to define what are, the, you know, what are the edge cases, how do they get resolved? Where are the lawyers in all this? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think it's because everyone wants a positive product at the end of the day, and I always like to think about the Wall Street Journal test of, you know, do you want to be in the paper because you, your website didn't have the most up-to-date version of your rules? And I think when we present it like that, of, hey, we all want to present the best face, best, uh, face possible to the consumer, I think we're going to get people on board. Can I take maybe the other side of that, and this might get me thrown off the judges panel, so. <laughs> Anytime you say I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? <laughs> what do you think this does to lender adoption, um, to, to have regulators and, and lenders sitting in the same ecosystem? Um, because that, 
seems right. to me like it could be a challenge. Um, so yeah, I have some colleagues here from that industry and they're gonna answer that for you. Yeah, I think well, one of the problems that we're seeing is that folks are afraid to invest in this technology right now. And by having industry standards, it could raise the floor of how many people in the mortgage industry are actually adopting this technology. And so I think it's actually really helpful, right? It's similar back to the AUS example. Uh, by putting in those standards, it set a ground, like a framework for the whole industry to kind of ride on. A quick question here. What, uh, can you describe a little bit about consumer consent? How does the consumer interacting with the chat box, how do they provide consent? Do they, if there are multiple times that they interact in like multiple days, do they provide it each of those days? What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. And I can even speak to, you know, our experience inside of my company, um, where every day when I want to be able to use uh, our generative AI solution, I have to say, yes, I'm logging in and yes, I, I understand what's going on. So we would see that as, you know, a session token, really, that would probably be a reasonable amount, maybe eight hours. And then as that session token expires, they would have to re-opt in. And I, we think it's gonna be a consumer value because not everyone works traditional hours um, and not everyone's gonna be able to access when the mortgage lines are open. So we think customers are, are gonna see this as a value. And one, one other thing to add there, this is gonna be uh, accessible via an API. So if you're working with another tech vendor who's providing this like chatbot service, for example, it would almost become like a stamp of approval. Hey, I'm integrated to Pace. Mm -hmm. And then that would give, that would help kind of, again, bring that floor up. Uh, for more folks to adopt it. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, the Arsenal. All right, hello everybody. Are we awake? We're saving the best for last. Um, my name is Ivan, we got Ed here with you. This particular issue is near and dear to my heart. My mom suffers from a number of disabilities and this has been an immense challenge uh, all throughout her life. But the problem scope, there are 42.5 million Americans that have a disability today. Of that, 4% of the homes in the United States today are ADA compliant, only 4%. And of those 4% of those homes, sorry, and of those homes, only 0.15% are wheelchair accessible. Again, a fraction of a percentage, 0.15% of homes are wheelchair compliant. The Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973 states that and mandates that developments that receive federal funds must allocate at least 5% of their units for ADA compliance or for people with physical disabilities. We anticipate that this creates an immense amount of exposure for borrowers to the tune of over $1 trillion. Now, our solution and proposal is to leverage Gen AI capabilities to ensure that multifamily home loan submissions to the GACs are ADA compliant. Now, our solution will do the following. It's gonna have the following key features. It's gonna leverage both text and vision, generative capabilities. It will be multimodal. It will leverage existing incentive programs. So you don't have to build a new incentive program. You can inject it or embed it in an existing one. And our solution will be modular and portable. This is important for scalability, right? This can extend beyond just this program into other programs such as green lending and maybe even some operational use cases it's modular and portable. Now, introducing the industry's first ADA compliance tool called ADA Comply. The ADA Comply solution will be a web application housed on a GSE website, and it will leverage a series of multimodal endpoints or inputs that will be both borrower provisioned or from public record, including building sketches, interior and exterior photos, appraisals, as well as housing codes, and photos potentially from listings um, or public, other county public record information. 
the output will be a compliance report with a series of remediation steps. And those remediation steps will also include photo renders on how to uh, become compliant. Now, this is an example of an exterior multifamily building that is non-ADA compliant. This rendering essentially shows how to become ADA compliant with a ADA compliant on-ramp and a wheelchair accessible parking lot with a handicapped parking. This next one is an example of a non-ADA compliant interior bathroom. And then we generate a bathroom image with ADA compliant features such as a toilet railing and an increased toilet height toilet. Now, we, we believe that there are five major value propositions to this solution. The first one is that it's gonna uh, provide equitable housing plan compliance. It's gonna provide certification. It will provide pricing incentives to multifamily lenders. It provides remediation steps and costs to help remediate some of the ADA non-compliance. And of course, it prevents lawsuits and liability. I'm going to have Ed, Ed walk you through some of the technical implementation. Uh, so we've put together a rough architecture package for our software solution. Uh, this is a sophisticated uh, software pipeline with both AI and non-AI components. Uh, so for your benefit, we've surrounded any of the Gen AI components with a purple box, and we highlight the specific type of Gen AI model used. To walk you through quickly the flow from left to right, this is just our data collection solution on the screen. The trigger for our software um, is an address, and we then undertake a programmatic gathering of data using publicly available sources like listing websites, Google Street View, satellite, and local building codes. At that point, point we prompt the user to up upload any extra required data, so we have a complete package of that data. We can then move on to the agentic part of our software, where we believe the true power of generative AI shines. And the big thing to call out here is our use of both language and vision generative models. So taking these inputs from the previous step, that data collection software, um, we run the images first through a vision language model and then combine that with the structured data to generate our compliance score, remediation steps, and estimated costs. We then pass those user uploaded images through a stable diffusion model to augment them and generate a new set of images according to our remediation steps. You've obviously seen an example of that on some previous slides. These are then combined with previous outputs to generate the final report output, which includes these steps, the cost estimate, and the image package. So there are no Gen AI solutions that are without risks, right? So we anticipate that there are gonna be two major risks, but there, there are many, but we'd like to highlight two. The first one is that uh, the use of fraudulent or outdated information, right? Um, borrower may provide old photos of the interior or exterior, or they're fraudulent. And one way you can mitigate that is to have the borrower actually provide the interior and exterior photos up front, or maybe through a mobile app. Right, so you can kind of geolock them or geolocate them. That's one potential solution or mitigating um, a way to mitigate the risk. Another one, of course, is inherent to Gen AI is uh, the risk of hallucinations and biases. And the way you can address that is incorporate additional public record data or more data into the models. Um, we we believe that you could inject this into um, the existing equitable housing um, plan for 2024 as a way for implementation. And of course, there's ability for future scalability for other use cases, including operations for developers, um, as well as loan servicing. Again, it's modular, and it can be extended to other use cases. I'd like to leave you with this quote from uh, Stella Young, which says, my disability exists not because I use a wheelchair, but because the broader environment isn't accessible. All right, thank you, team. Judges, off to you. I mean, it, this is, I mean, you're right. Uh, when you said uh, you saved the best presentation for the last, right? So uh, when it comes to like fair housing violations, right? So in the past a couple of years, uh, disability has actually been trending. And uh, this is really a good use case to address uh, that problem. 
Now, um, when you presented like the risk uh, uh, slide, right? I'm curious to know what role, like what governance controls are in place to make sure that the alternative recommendation that is coming from the Gen AI system is still peer reviewed in terms of like complying with the actual uh, ADA code. That's a great question. Yeah, I'll, 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 one okay. thing I'll contribute, which is, it was, sorry, it was it was on the slide, but maybe maybe not touched on directly, is that ultimately this is a suggestive tool and it's not authoritative. We believe that the GSE is ultimately at that last line of authority, and we believe that would be sort of a human in the loop who is actually manually reviewing um, the outputs of this or the actual remediations. Um, as with all Gen AI solutions, sort of that last line of defense, that being a human is an important, really important step. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, well, let me ask uh, the, oops, go Jane. Go ahead. I'm just gonna ask you to talk a little bit more to the overall impact, I mean, and great, great presentation, but the overall impact of folks that could be uh, helped through this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like the, the immediate impact is the fact that there are so many non-ADA compliant homes. So there's sort of this enforcement gap that exists, right? Um, that's so difficult. And so we imagine that there's an incentive on the front end for lenders through price concessions. And then there's an immediate incentive to, to, for, for social impact as well. And then of course, the obvious benefits to those who have disabilities, right? And wheelchair accessibility is a huge problem. Um, so we, we, I think the incentives are aligned all across sort of the ecosystem and, and, and the players that this kind of makes sense to implement. Yeah. I think three things I would also add here is when we, we read the equity browsing plan um, and some of the language in there actually covered some of the solutions. So from a compliance standpoint, we're helping the GSs, both Freddie and Fannie Mae, you know, stay compliant um, there. Number two, there are a lot of initiatives. You have the Green Lending Initiative, we have the you know, Healthy Housing Rewards Initiative that this could easily fit within. So it's actually more transaction volume for the GSs also because we can pre-qualify um, assets in this case. Certification is also important. We have initiatives like the course program out there. This can be an additional incentive. And the way we thought about it is no sticks. It's all incentives. We're not telling people what to do. We're just encourage them. And by doing that, the rising tide will lift all boats. Well said. Thank you so much, team. A round of applause for our team. And can we give it up one more time for all of our teams and their compelling use cases? Now it's time for the judges to deliberate. They've been taking notes on the 12 use cases you've seen on consumer experience, assessing creditworthiness, operations, and risk and compliance. And for everyone else, now is the time for networking, coffee. You can warm up. I know it's cold in here. Um, you can go back in the, in the conference uh, area and enjoy. Please be back in half an hour. You don't want to miss our recognitions announcements. Thank you so much. All right, we hope you've enjoyed that break. We're getting everyone in their seats for this recognition announcement. Um, we're really excited. All right, all right. Do we wanna make sure we have everybody? I was told not to dance on stage to buy time, so I won't. Even though it looks like I'm going to a disco, I won't, I won't, I won't do it. Are you guys excited to hear the recognitions? I know I am.
it's so secret that I don't even know. Well, welcome back, everyone, officially. We hope you enjoyed the break and had a chance to recharge. And to our virtual audience, thank you for sticking with us. We appreciate you being here and hope you're excited for the recognition announcements. So the judges have finished their deliberations, and we are ready to recognize some outstanding use cases, risk mitigants, and the dedicated teams behind the ideas. Now, it's my pleasure to in introduce Tracy Steffen, FHFA's Chief AI Officer who will lead us through the recognition announcements. Tracy brings over 20 years of experience in mortgage technology and currently leads FHFA's Office of Financial Technology, driving responsible innovation and strengthening FHFA's AI governance. Prior to joining FHFA, she held key positions at Fannie Mae, where she led enterprise innovation and oversaw critical technology operations. Tracy's journey in innovation literally began on her first day at Fannie Mae, writing code to support their capital market systems back when all coding was done by hand. Now please join us in welcoming Tracy Steffen. Thank you, Lawrence and Leah. It's an honor to be back here today and witness the incredible talent and innovation showcased by all the teams. The judges had a tough time with their selections because every presentation was pretty amazing. Now let's get on to it. For each category, one of our judges will come up and announce the recognized team. Then the team will be able to come across the front of the stage here and take a photo with Deputy Director of Decor, Anne-Marie Pippin. Let's begin with the most promising use of generative AI for consumer experience. This will be announced by Jan Davis. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I get started, I just want to congratulate um, Tracy and the whole team on a fantastic uh, experience today and all of the folks who were involved. You guys did great. So um, it is my honor to uh, have the opportunity to recognize the team that um, uh, congratulate the team with the uh, most promising use of Gen AI for consumer experience. Um, it's Open Angel, so <laughs> congratulations. The, uh, the judges conversation, we just wanted to, you know, you guys did a fantastic job um, on talking about the uh, standardized rental application through an Uber-like experience. Um, significant opportunity to improve the consumer experience to help make that rental process more efficient. Um, loved the opportunity to coach folks who are not yet ready to, uh, to help them to become ready. So congratulations. Thank you and congratulations. Next, we have the most promising use of Gen AI for assessing creditworthiness. Recognition will be announced by Jeff Walker. Uh, good afternoon. It's just such a pleasure to be here with you guys, and I'm so thankful for the effort that all of the teams put together um, and put in over the last three days. Um, great to see old friends as well, so thank you for having me here. Um, I have the pleasure of announcing for assessing credit worthiness, the three, uh, the three teams were the AI astronauts, the DPA to AI, and Inafair. Um, every one of you guys had some really compelling use cases. Ultimately, um, the judges, and I'm very pleased to announce, um, selected AI astronauts. Um, and I think... Some of the things that just sort of put you guys sort of above and beyond was, look, when you get a consumer in a home, you want to keep them in the home. And it's so challenging, and there's so many factors. And if we can use Gen AI 
to help understand some of those um, factors earlier in the process and ensure that people continue the ability to create generational wealth. We just uh, applaud you guys and thank you for your effort. Well done, AI Stratz. Now let's move on to the most promising use of Gen AI for operations recognition. And here to announce that team is Melissa Coy. So it's a pleasure to be back as a judge, a second year. Thank you for this opportunity, Team FHFA. And uh, I had, as you all heard, enthusiasm for so many of the different uh, proposals that were put out. Mortgage Minds and FAIR, thank you both for the real diligence in thinking about operations and where the dynamism of these new LLMs can be deployed. Um, on behalf of all the judges, I'm pleased to announce that we identified Team FAIR as the winner of this category. So if you would, please come on up. I think everybody recognizes, you know, fraud is just generating such enormous costs throughout the financial sector. And when it comes to opportunities for multifamily housing, it's a really important use case. Uh, what's really exciting about how this group is thinking about using more complex analytics is also the fact that they're thinking about, as you heard us dialogue, you know, bringing in more data to make sure that the insights and the learnings, both from larger lenders but also smaller lenders, are going to be a part of that process because this is the opportunity to reduce the false positives, which have such an impact from an inclusion standpoint. So, congrats, Team Fair. Congratulations, Team Fair. And finally, we have most promising use of Gen AI for risk and compliance recognition. Announcing this is Michael Neal. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, FHFA team. Um, thank you, everyone who participated. Uh, like, has all, I want to echo what everyone has already said about just how terrific and how compelling each of those demos uh, were. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we did have the task of narrowing it down uh, to one, and I, I like to say that the winner was uh, Manchester United. Uh, whoops, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was the Arsenal. Um, you know, and I want to uh, uh, n note a few things as they as as they come up. You know, certainly we were as a as a committee really impressed with the uh, the multimodal aspect uh, of their uh, of their of their demo. Um, their focus on um, sticks uh, compared to incentives, um, as well as uh, the uh, possibility for it to be applied uh, in other use cases. Um, uh, one thing that the committee did want to also point out is certainly, you know, keeping in mind some of the implications uh, for race and ethnicity here. Certainly, uh, older buildings, buildings that tend are less likely to be ADA compliant may reside in communities of color and those that are historically marginalized. So it's going to be critical to find ways to uh, ensure that uh, these types of, that this, uh, the, the, this product does not uh, unnecessarily uh, bias them. Thank you. Congratulations to those teams whose ideas were recognized and to every team that presented today. The work that you've done this week is truly inspiring, and this is just the beginning of what we can accomplish together. As Anne Marie mentioned, this tech sprint is just one of the tools FHFA uses to encourage and support responsible innovation and use of AI to balance technological advancements with regulatory and consumer safeguards. And as I mentioned on opening day, we believe the tech sprint can create, help create and foster the kind of environment where we believe responsible innovation can best take place. One where the best solutions, the most efficient, the most equitable can be discovered. The goal of this tech sprint is not to develop one market ready solution, but to create the community and the environment required to develop the best solutions and to continue to help improve them. Helping the industry better interact with the government to understand each other's priorities, connect the dots and make and build connections. 
to inspire continued innovation, ideation, problem solving, and dialogue and collaboration between different groups outside of this room after the tech sprint is over. I'm not just speaking about the participants, I'm talking to all of you in the room and on the live stream, wherever you sit in the industry. Hopefully you have seen how to identify and understand housing's biggest opportunities, challenges, and frictions as our teams discovered ideas that may have the potential to take hold in housing finance in the near and not so near future. Hopefully you've seen also how to identify, understand, and mitigate key risks associated with generative AI proactively, how the technology may impact your own operations and how to go about getting in front of the risks that come with it. But not just you, not just one of you, all of you, representatives from the public and private sectors, from inside and outside the housing system, single family and multifamily, businesses and regulators, side by side. Here we all are at the table, the Gen AI table, from the very start. At the Tech Sprint, you've seen just how broad the benefits of AI are. You've seen how broad the risks are too, and as AI becomes more automated and integrated into business processes, the risks will become more interconnected and complex. And reliance on AI without sufficient risk, oversight, and transparency, those risks will only be amplified. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to mitigate those risks? The ones we know and the ones we don't. The ones that no one's even dreamed up yet. By working together, just like we did this week. By collaborating to balance the excitement with some of the fundamental key principles that will ensure that we have equitable outcomes from the use of AI, like fairness. Ensuring AI does not discriminate and adheres to existing regulations, like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act. Like transparency. AI that's understandable, not only when developing test models, but also when the models are being used so that each decision can be traced and explained. Like accountability, clearly defining responsibilities for AI outcomes. Who is responsible when the AI generates an unintended outcome? What are the consequences? And like privacy, protecting user data according to existing privacy laws. How do we ensure that private information is not shared beyond permissible use? If we don't consider foundational principles such as these, principles outlined in FHFA's advisory bulletin 2022-02, outcomes from the misuse of AI could, could easily perpetuate, amplify existing disparities and introduce new forms of discrimination. In our industry, we have been able to identify challenges before. We've managed to come up with great solutions for them before, even technology solutions but we've always been challenged by adopting solutions after we've discovered them. Adoption in housing is hard. That's why it's so, more, so important now more than ever for businesses and regulators to work together from the very beginning. So let me, say by say, let me just close by saying that I am encouraged by the energy at this tech sprint and by the energy that is occurring more broadly around AI in the government and regulatory agencies energy that was greatly increased by the recent executive order on AI. There's a lot of work being done to move us toward creating an integrated understanding of risks and best practices. I'm encouraged so much so that I can say that we are truly on our way to beginning to understand the possibilities and making them a reality. We hope you are too. And if not, then send us an email, give us a call. Let's have a meeting because the time is now. We hope you enjoyed the presentations and feel as inspired as we do. Have a great day, and on behalf of FHFA, thank you.